Welcome to the Nature's Image Farm podcast. We're glad you're here. I'm Greg. And I'm Susan. And together we're raising seven kids on the farm and learning life lessons along the way. So pull up a chair, rest your heels, and let's talk all things bees, homesteading, and the old time ways. Let's get after it. If you're interested in nukes, packages, queens, or supplies, visit us on the web at naturesimagefarm.com. Well, hey guys, welcome back to the Nature's Image Farm podcast, YouTube channel, and the one, the only stream team beekeeping chat. Bruce, Brian, how's it going, fellas? Going good. How are you guys doing? Good. Pretty good. You know, it's it's been a wild, uh, it's been a wild ride out here lately. It's uh, if you feel like something, you just have something on your shoulders, Bruce. You just want to get off there. It's just a real weight over here. It's just sucking me dry. <laughs> I'm really excited tonight to uh, to announce uh, and to debut the world's only, the very first and finest. Are you guys ready? Can you handle this? The one, the only, Varroa Mike. Yeah? Huh? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's... This this is a one of the very finest, you know, there's a lot of folks out there three didn't three D printing and and doing all those. But if you want the absolute best three D printed beekeeping uh, stuff, there's only one person you can go get it from. And that's this fellow right there. Boom. Brian Coper. Well done, Brian. This is one heck of a Varroa mite. Look at and look at Bruce's, man. Bruce's is staying on his shoulder. It's like that long lost friend you just really it's just like they can't climb get up on the bees. Leave. They just climb right up there and they just you know, you have to like, Bruce, it, it's, it it's, oh almost, it's almost like you need to call up, you know, NOD, get Tom to send you something or, or call up Rob, you know, you need like immediate treatment. Oh no, man. Rob, Rob Pollock, what, what is the recommended uh, dosage of oxalic acid to get rid of uh, Varroa mics? <laughs> 20 grams. Oh goodness. How much fun. Yeah. I did get a package today of formic pro so i'm gonna be trying and i got enough oh, wow. for 60 treatments so we'll see how that oh my gosh that works out i don't wow. know if i'll use it all right away but i'm gonna try it out i've got enough to last a little while if i need to yeah yeah wow looks like <clears throat> did did i freeze or did greg freeze or <laughs> look at the screen we got a screenshot that that's perfect look at that here just kind of <laughs> look just we could all smile that's a perfect thumbnail right there yep there it is. Uh, it's going to be one of those nights with the internets. I'm afraid it's uh, rough. Or the the Starlink thing doesn't work when there's any kind of storm clouds yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And the other ones is uh, is, is iffy. So if I fade in and out, I'll just I'll trust you guys to just uh, keep going with it. But I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us here, uh, listening live, the stream team, beekeeping chat. If you're listening to the Nature's Image Farm podcast, welcome. And for all the folks uh, watching this video later, uh, we want to thank you for that. Fellas, we thought uh, what, what Susie and I are trying to do, we get a lot of questions this time of year. Oh, no. On what we to do is, oh. is provide information for folks that they can just um, reach out. They can, they can snag that piece of information, and then they can reach out to us with follow-up questions. And I think it saves them a lot of time on the phone. Um, and it sometimes saves us from asking or from answering the same questions over and over again, which we're happy to do. Um, but uh, we thought this would be a great way to get some of the basic information pertaining to what we do here at Nature's Image Farm. Of course, beekeeping basics. Um, I think everyone who has a YouTube channel should consider putting out uh, what that means to them because it's all going to be a little bit different. Um, for us, being that we do sell packages, we do sell nukes, we sell queens, we sell supplies. Um, we want to be able to get some information out to not only our customers, um, but uh, folks who just have some of the basic questions. And I thought, hey, what finer fellas to have into this conversation than uh, Brian Coper from uh, Castle Hives, Northeast Ohio, and our pal Bruce Jenny down in Dothan, Alabama, the Dothan Shogun himself. And uh, show, let's, show enough, let's show open enough. up this conversation. What is what is better, <clears throat> nukes or packages? Um, so there, there's a lot to it. Uh, we're definitely... I'm going to take some to the end. Oh, gosh. 
Oh boy. There's going to be plenty of ad libbing tonight. Looks like it. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> Brian is the real show gun. This this show tonight is just it's 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 going off the chains. See? We'll wait for him. We'll wait for him. Well, yeah, you know our our weather our weather here is pretty crazy here this evening. It, it's been all day. Um, I walked outside to go to work today, and the car was coated in ice, and then it was raining, and then it's so it, it's yeah, it's it's pretty bad between the wind and clouds and everything. I'm sure the connections for a lot of people are are pretty pretty sketchy. So I think we were around 75 degrees down here today. Wow. Yeah. I know, I know, you know, Greg, Greg tonight, he wanted to talk about the difference between nukes and uh, packages. There he goes. He, he, he dropped off. He dropped off. That's, you know, Gosh, Elon, really, I mean, we need Elon, him on here. Cause that's his, that's his, that's his specialty. So hopefully it is. Back yeah. On yeah. You know, it amazes me that Elon can put a car on the tip of a rocket and shoot it to Mars, but we can't have good Wi-Fi. <clears throat> it does seem strange. Yeah, yeah. And but here, you know, here in town, we've got, you know, where you got cable, it's pretty good. But I think if you're yeah. trying to depend on, like obviously he is, it's kind of rough. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, yeah. <clears throat> when you're depending on a satellite, it's, you know. Yeah, you there's do? Tom. Tom's on here. So Tom, we got the. Maybe you oh, saw there we the go. beginning. We got the Varroa mites here, and uh, I did get some Formic Pro in the mail today, so we're going to try it out. Just to let you know that, Tom. Greg, we got Tom, the right person for, uh, for joining us there. I'm, I might be in and out tonight, guys, so I'll, I'll trust the, you guys to carry the conversation until we can um, pick back up here. But um, maybe we'll just we'll keep this into a format to make it easy for folks to kind of follow along. We'll maybe bring up a question or a topic and then we'll just round table it and we'll just keep the conversation moving there. There are so many questions when it comes to which is better, which is faster, which is more expensive, which will make more honey, which will get through the winter, which ones can you split? It goes on and on and on. So let's, let's talk about it um, a little bit. Um, Brian, have you had experiences um, with both packages and nukes? If so, talk to us a little bit about what your early experience is with both. So I've had both. Um, my experience with packages, well, let me, I'll, I'll save packages for a second. My experience with nukes was I purchased a nuke off of uh, someone in Ohio, um, not Nature's Image Farm. That's where I went wrong. Uh, but it was somebody that I did not know took his word on the fact that, hey, this is a good nuke. And now it was, you know, I can't entirely point a finger at the individual that sold me the nuke because I wasn't educated enough myself to know, well, what should I look for? What should I ask? What, you know, how should I go about purchasing a nuke? And when I got the, you know, when I got to the person's place, they really didn't show me anything. They were like, well, there it is. It's taped up. It's you're good. Just take it on home. Great. You know, I got a nuke. And when I got home, I think the thing had two or so frames of bees in it. And it just, you know, I think I got basically like a, you know, a old queen or whatever, but it just failed. Two or so months, three months, it was gone. I mean, the colony just did not last. Um, so that was my nuke experience. And I, I said from that point, I will never purchase another one from somebody that I do not know that way. You know, I don't get into that situation. If I know the person, then you know how they they set them up. You know, um, my packages. I, I've purchased several packages through my years. That's that's in fact how I started. Um, for me, purchasing a package seemed to be it pointed me in the right direction as far as learning. Um, I was able to see colonies. You know, instead of when you get a nuke, you know, you have that established colony and you really don't get to see that initial phase of where they build. So, you know, I guess like we always say, context is 
key if you want to start from scratch and watch a colony build out. If you're going foundationless and you watch them build that comb, if you have foundation, you know, you watch them build that out. But for me, I learned more from purchasing packages, installing a good package, watching them build out, watching that colony grow. I've had a lot of success with packages. Um, packages, you know, they, they tend to be cheaper, at least, you know, in Ohio, uh, than nukes. So, you know, if you're looking to save money, you know, every, everybody knows, you know, beekeeping does not come cheap. So if you're looking to save some money, you can get packages from somebody, you know, such as, you know, and I, I know I'm always talking about your place, Greg, but, you know, the packages that Greg has, I set them up, you know, when I had my, when I entered that valley of despair, you see what I'm referencing, Greg? Um, <laughs> you know, I started out, you know, I started again with packages and now you see where those packages are, you know, and, and folks, there's a lot of people that say, oh, you can't pull honey from packages the first year. You can't do this and that, you know, and I, and I think some of that might just be marketing just to sell their nukes. I've done all of that. I've pulled honey off of packages the first season, you know, um, I've watched them grow and, you know, um, just explode. You know, I think the benefit also to the package and, I, and I've done it, you know, set up two separate colonies and you dump a little bit here, dump a little bit there, get an extra queen. Boom. You just, you know, you paid one, one price, you got an extra queen and now you have two colonies that are going to build up. So, but like I said, I mean, context is, is key there. And it just, I guess it just depends on what road you want to go down. But for me, um, packages have always worked out exceptionally well. Um, I see R Rainier asking, did those packages have comb? Uh, the packages that I've always gotten, they're just, they're in a typical, I don't know what those containers are, you know, the wood with the screen and you've got the feeder can in it and you know, you've got your queen cage in there, but that's, that's how they, they oh, uh, that I harvested honey from. Now it's once they're set up, um, you know, you just harvest later on in the year. So, but now I, I will say like when I did harvest, so when I installed the packages, I think, what was it, Greg, two years ago when I got the packages now from mm -hmm. you, I, right. I had drawn comb. So I, I guess if you look at when I started again, all of my colonies, I had drawn comb. So, and, and we all know drawn comb is like gold, but, you know, if I were to purchase bees again, I probably would go down the road of just getting a package just because I want to see that colony develop from the ground up. You know, I, I suppose getting a nuke, I mean, it does have its benefits. Um, and, you know, there are those folks out there that might say, well, I want to have that, you know, established colony. I want to see all, you know, phases of, you know, brood. I want to see this and that. And while that might be true, but, you know, for me, I just like that fresh start is always where I've started at. So, and, and, you know, it's worked out really well. So that's, uh, that's at least my input, you know, as far as packages and nukes. I mean, it's, I've been in both, you know, situations with the nuke and the packages and the nuke from my one experience, it, it didn't work out. Now, I will say this and everybody that's listening, if, you know, you get a nuke from, you know, I'm not saying that all nukes are bad. If you get a nuke from somebody that's a reputable business and, you know, they'll take time and work with you and everything like that and, and just even show you around the apiary that says a lot, you know, right. um, if I were ever to get a colony from you, you know, a nuke from you, I know those nukes are packed out and I know that they're going to perform. So, you know, I can't just say that I'll eliminate all nukes. Um, but you know, my, just, my experience is I just had a bad one. Well, that's, that's good. And we're going to dig into a lot of those. Um, you, you had several things that I want to dig into there. Um, Brian, uh, but first, Bruce, uh, what's what's been your experience, um, your brief experience with packages or nukes, if any at all? Well, I've never installed a package. 
believe it or not, I've always used nukes <clears throat> or just made splits from my own. But I started my beekeeping endeavor with uh, two nukes and then bought two more later in the year. And that's where everything started. I've honestly, I've bought a few queens over the years and I did buy a few nukes from a friend. He was selling them for a really good price. Uh, just to kind of help plug in some slots on some of my pallets a couple of years ago, two or three years ago. But for the most part, um, I just, I bought nukes or I've, you know, uh, that's all I've ever sold to if people want to buy nukes. So I don't have any experience with packages. Uh, you know, I'm interested in maybe trying some just to say I have, and I can see the wisdom in that. Also, we've had some comments in here about, I think someone mentioned earlier about sometimes if you buy nukes, you're buying other people's problems. Uh, you know, people split if they're not careful. And so, and I do know that's one way that, that as a, a, a breeder, uh, it, you know, as you sell off nukes, you are, you, that's one way to kind of rotate your comb around. Of course, the person who gets that nuke will be able to begin, you know, building out some new comb and start rotating it out as well. So it's kind of a, a method people use, but I've, I've always kind of believed in nukes. I've always thought that was probably the better way to go, but I can't speak from experience with packages because I've never utilized them before. Although I do see the wisdom in it, especially it is more affordable, I believe. I don't know of any place where packages are more than nukes in the same spot. Now, you may have packages that sell in one state for as much or more than nukes do in another state because it's regional. But if, you know, like right here in Alabama, if we were making packages and nukes, I think the package would be less expensive because there's not as many resources going into that with the comb and the brood and everything that goes along with it. And so I love the idea of, of nukes because you start off with a, a colony that is a colony if it's done properly you know if you have someone that throws a bunch of frames of brood in a hive with some bees and sticks a queen in there and it's not really established and they sell that as a nuke i guess that's possible to do that and it may survive but when i'm talking about a nuke i'm talking about a, a box that's been together for some time and we know that queen is in there she's been in there for at least a, a little while and we know she's laying in that colony that that mm -hmm. is her that she is in charge of, or you know that she's running that thing that she's laying eggs in there and and it, we want to i want to only purchase or sell nukes that i know are a thriving colony when they leave my bee yard and so that's kind of how i look at it um i know there's tricks i know there are tricks out there that people use i know you can get into some bad products with both packages and nukes that might be full of mites or disease and uh you got to be careful, know what to look for. And I think that is probably more of an issue maybe with nukes, I would think, uh, theoretically, because if you're a brand new pe beekeeper going to buy a nuke from someone and you don't know what you're looking at, you know, you might get a, a weak one or you may not know if it's a good quality nuke or not. Whereas packages pretty much usually come from reputable folks and they have to weigh the bees and everything. And so I think it's a more consistent product, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, that's just a couple of thoughts I have on that. But I've always been a nuke guy. I've always been an established colony guy. That's kind of what I've done um, in the past. Who knows what the future holds? Well, those are all great points. And I, I, I'm enjoying the comments um, going back and forth because there are some folks that are just diehard packages. There are some that are diehard nukes. Um, and I think um, tonight I'm going to just uh, – I, I first let me say I appreciate everyone's experience, uh, and just because we might talk about it and our experience is different, uh, and in no way are we belittling or lessening uh, your experience. Uh, but we're going to be speaking tonight from uh, just from our experience, um, and I, there is absolutely pros and cons to both packages and nukes. Uh, tonight we're going to get into it. We're going to get into availability, uh, pricing. Will they produce honey? Uh, will they make it through the winter time? Are you inheriting somebody else's problem, somebody else's disease? Um, there is a there is, as you can imagine, with beekeeping, there are many myths uh, about uh, a lot of these different things. Uh, but the first one I wanted to kind of bring up uh, is is availability. Uh, different parts of the country are going to be able to make bees way earlier than we can up north uh, because of that. Folks who want to start their beekeeping journey in March or April, as soon as spring hits and the weather's turning nice, a spring nuke is not going to be for them. A spring nuke typically is a colony of bees that is split uh, out of your overwintered stock. They're split. Uh, a, a fresh queen cell is added to that split. Uh, the queen goes off. She gets mated. She comes back. She starts laying. She starts filling out that nucleus colony. 
And then that colony is sold as a nuke. That's how we do it here in Ohio. Because of that, we're at the mercy of the weather and of that timing. And those nukes are available no sooner than the end of May. And it, a lot depends on when our first blooms happen. Right now, our maples uh, are, are today, our sugar maples are nearly in full bloom. And bees are bringing all kinds of pollen in right now. So we, if everything continues down this path, we'll likely be at a late May uh, availability on when our first nukes are going to be available. Why does that matter? Well, when folks want to get that early jump, it's usually for two reasons. The first reason I think a lot of folks want bees as soon as they can possibly get them is because they're new. They just took their, their beginning beekeepers class. They're fresh. They want to get excited. They want to get started. Um, and they want bees as soon as they can possibly get them. So for that reason alone, packages do have a big part of the market because you can offer folks their package of bees in April. We have packages available right now for pickup at the farm April 8th, the day before Easter. There's no way we can make a spring nuke that early. We could, we could get in and, and we will talk about overwintered nukes versus spring nukes uh, later on tonight because there is a big difference. There is a massive misconception and we're going to help shed a little bit of light on, on that as well. Uh, so availability does play a, a big part into which people choose. Uh, so the brand new beekeeper, they might decide a package is for them because they want to get started early. Um, somebody else that, that that a package may be for them is if they if they if their bees died in the wintertime and they're sitting on a lot of drawn comb and a lot of equipment, they want to throw bees on that as soon as they possibly can. Rather than waiting until late May or June to add bees to their dead out equipment, it's a in my opinion, it's a great idea to throw something like a package on that. That that way you are uh, ensuring that that comb does get used and doesn't get abused and ate up and destroyed by hive beetles and wax moss as the season does get on. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of ways you can help preserve those boxes and the wax, but in the grand scheme of things, a lot of folks are leaving their equipment outside for Mother Nature to do what she will. Throwing a package on those in April is one of the best ways to protect the investment of all that draw and comb uh, and to make sure it doesn't get loaded full of creepy crawlies that you don't want in there. So there's a couple things that uh, packages um, have the advantage uh, when it comes with that debate. Um, pricing, you know, that's, this is where this gets a little bit tricky. If you actually priced out what you're getting for a package versus what you're getting for a nuke, you're getting a lot more bang for your buck with a nuke. No, no matter which way you cut it, um, you are, you know, for instance, you know, most averages in the, in the country – um, for packages or as low as $130 um, all the way up to $170 for a package. And that's three pounds of bees that were shaken out of uh, several different colonies, all shaken together uh, into a, a screened cage with a mated queen that's added. That's not their queen. She's in a cage with attendants inside of that package. And uh, there is a certain risk involved with installing that package Sometimes it's no problem at all. A lot of times there's things you can do to mitigate that, but there are times where maybe that queen wasn't properly mated. Maybe those bees just don't flat out don't like her. She's not pumping the pheromone like, like they would like her to. They think something's wrong. That Maybe they let her out of the cage just to lay enough eggs to supersede her and requeen her. That happens too. And that requeening event sometimes isn't necessarily a fault of the queen. A lot of times it's the stress inside of a colony. It's the stress of all those things all at once um, that can, can trigger that. That's where I think nukes are a little bit safer. Nukes for, for on average, you know, $185 to $235 across the country. You're getting a five-frame nuke. You're getting three frames of brood, of frames that are all drawn out, uh, filled with various stages of brood, and you're getting mm -hmm. some resource frames. There's going to be some pollen. Uh, there might be some open nectar. There might be some capped honey. But what you have is a little snapshot of a colony, five frames with everything rocking and rolling and jamming. Mama's in there running around, laying up a storm. Everyone's happy, happy, happy. Uh, you throw those into your box and they just cruise. They build. So there are some, some pretty obvious differences. Um, if you were to price that out, let's say at $200 uh, for what you get there, 
it's still on average, it's probably three and a half pounds of bees, maybe four, depending on the nuke. Um, but the queen is already established. She's already laying. She already has a huge head start. And you're getting frames full of honey. But the caveat is you can't pick that nuke up until late May or early June in Ohio. Yeah. So when you start with a package in April, that package is going to be pretty close to that same size by the end of May or, or June anyways. So it really depends on what, what part of this experience do you want to have? I like, Brian, what you said, because you wanted to see these bees build from nothing and grow. And you wanted it. You wanted to, um, you assumed that risk. You wanted to see that process all the way through. There, there's an intimacy with that. There's a lot of nuance to it. Um, so I think that that plays into it as well. Um, I think for beginning beekeepers, those who are just getting started, we always recommend, the, I think the most safest bet for folks who, it, it depends on what their risk level is. If it's if they just want to keep their bees alive the first year, nukes are usually uh, less risk involved. If they get two or three nukes, they get them installed, they can compare all those nukes in the same yard. Everything's, there, there's less hiccups um, along the way. Um, and most of the time, packages are also, there's not a lot of risk there, too, if things are done correctly from the very beginning. And that's where a lot of package failures actually come in. It has very little to do with the package. It has very little to do with the queen. A lot of the initial failure has to do with how those packages were installed and that first seven-day period. Were they getting fed properly? What kind of comb were they on? What kind mm -hmm. of stress was involved in them getting installed? Did they get installed correctly? Did you install all those packages with all the entrances wide open and the bees were, were flying out and drifting and doing that? There's so many things that can happen. And so I think a lot of that initial experience has a lot to do um, with that. But Brian, you, you talked earlier about you had a nuke. Uh, you didn't have the best of luck with it. Um, packages were kind of a, a, a sure bet for you. Bruce, you mentioned uh, that you've you're, in the past, your experience has really been based on of uh, utilizing nukes um, to, to grow your yard. Um, what do you, what are your guys' thoughts on folks who are trying to, um, if we, if we, if we classify the beginning beekeepers side of it, that they might have a, a certain approach on whether a package or a nuke is right for them. Um, but the fact of the matter is sometimes folks, whether it's their second year or their 10th year, I'm going to, I'm going to say it and I'm going to ruffle, I'm going to ruffle some feathers so, but I'm still going to say it, and we're going to talk about why. There's a lot of folks who still buy bees 10 years later, five years later, and they're not wrong to do so, and we're going to talk why that that is. Where do you guys feel, uh, or Bruce, where do you feel that nukes have an advantage um, over packages, if you feel they do, uh, for folks who are not only getting started, but for folks who are building a bee yard? Well, you know, in my experience, especially here in the South, you know, we can obviously get started a little bit earlier down here. Um, I'm going to break out a bunch of splits this weekend. <laughs> so, um, and I've got a video coming out actually, which I'll discuss a little bit more later about some of the stuff. One of your Queens is involved in this video, Greg. So I'll have to talk about it a little bit later on, but, um, I, I just feel like to me, nukes, once again, you have a head start, I think. Tim or someone sit on here with nukes, you're kind of buying time. It was Tim or I can't remember who it was. I think it was Tim earlier in the thread here. Um, and that's true, I think, but, but you did make a point though. If the, if the nukes aren't going to be available until later in the year, then that's a different story. If you can get a, a month or two in on a package and let them build, then they might be about even. And if, if, you know, there's different reasons to do that. Um, but, but a nuke to me is just an established colony. Down here in the south, it warms up pretty quickly. By April, March or April, you know, it's warm enough. You can almost do some checkerboarding of frames, and they'll draw those things out sometimes in a week. I mean, you'll you'll put five frames in a in a ten frame box, and come back a week later. And I know that there's there's debate about this as well, how to install the nuke into a ten frame box. Uh, most people, a lot of people, will say put the nuke right down the middle and then put the new frames of foundation on the outside. And I've been told on my videos on my channel you should never ever checkerboard. You know there are a lot of absolutes out there, right, Greg? But when it's warm enough outside and we have a tremendous flow coming in, I found you know 
that if you check a board, just kind of alternate frames with foundation in that, in that drawn comb, or if you have some comb you want to put in there and get the bees on it, man, they will literally fill that out within a week. They can't stand to have that space in there. You know, if they have the resource to draw wax, they will draw it out so fast in a week to a week and a half later, you know, you're ready to put a second box on there. That queen's got it laid up and you're ready to go rock and roll. Now, if I was to put a nuke into a 10 frame box right now with foundation, I would drop the nuke right in the middle because it's still going to, we're going to still have some chilly nights. We don't want to get that chilled brood and the population mm -hmm. may not be enough to cover all those frames. So you just have to play it by ear and recognize what the situation is out there. But I love the nukes. To me, it's a motivated colony um, and they do well. I do understand, you know, there's a difference between overwintered nukes and new nukes in the spring. But I think once the, uh, the colony is established, I think they're pretty motivated and they do pretty well depending on genetics and so forth. And I've never really, I've never really thought that much about overwintered versus new nukes as long as they're established. But like I say, if you just take a, if you create your nuke like, like three or four days before the customer's going to come pick it up, you throw bees and and brood and everything, and you get a lot of bees in there. It looks like a beautiful nuke, and then you put a mated queen in there. You just give her a chance to lay a few eggs and you sell that thing. You really don't know what direction that nuke's going to go in, and so I think it needs to be the key is that the nuke is established, that the bees are laying it up, that you have. You know, you see them drawing out wax in that nuke. You see new eggs in that nuke. Uh, let that queen be in there long enough to establish that as that that hive of bees, that colony of bees. And I think you're more likely to have success that way. I do know that when you're buying nukes, so I think it's, like I said earlier, easier to get into trouble with that because, <clears throat> like, like Brian said, if you don't know who you're buying from, especially if you're a new beekeeper, you don't know what you're looking for, you can buy a lot of problems. I had a friend that was getting into beekeeping, and he was so excited. Here locally, he went and bought a couple of nuke or two. I, I think, I don't know if he bought a nuke or if he just went and looked at some nukes. Uh, a, a local guy here was selling them and he showed up and, and the nukes just were not healthy. This guy's selling them for whatever amount of money. I can't remember, I don't know what the price was, but, you know, three frames of bees, just not really healthy. And um, I don't think this guy really treats for mites. And so who knows what he was buying there. I'm, I think he might have backed out of that deal when he saw him. He may have seen enough videos or watched enough to know that that wasn't a good deal. But I do know people that have bought from that individual and have not had good success. And so you got to be careful what you're buying. And I do know too, I think, and Rob, Rob is on here. Correct me if I'm Rob, uh, if, if I'm wrong, Rob, but I think a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, Rob bought some packages and he put them in his colonies and, and treated with oxalic acid immediately which is a good time to do it by the way once they get kind of used to that box and they were full of mites and so you just gotta just gotta be careful you know what you're doing and but i do think that pack that nukes definitely have an advantage for someone if you want to hit the ground running that's good um that's just my opinion if i was a brand new beekeeper that's what i did and that's what i would probably do again is try and find an established uh, nuke and roll that way there's there's a lot lot to it, uh, and so uh, Bruce, I, I appreciate your experience with that. Bruce, I also want to thank you for the super chat. Uh, that that helps out a lot. We've got some giveaways coming up later this year, uh, so those super yeah. chats help just to put into the the fund for that. Uh, Brian, thank you as well uh, for the super chat uh, for tonight's uh, nukes versus packages debate. Um, I'm not sure if it's really a debate. It's just an open, honest um, discussion between it. But Brian, I, I appreciate that too. Brian's been busy. Uh, Brian came down to the farm and helped us uh, get phase two a little further along. So Brian, thanks for that. And again, Brian, thanks for the world's first, the one, the only Varroa Mike. That joke's never going to get old. You, know, you see what I did there? Varroa Mike. If you're just tuning in, check it out. Varroa Mike. Can't beat it. Um, also, I need gotta a, thank our. I need a I need a nickname for mine. Anybody got any ideas? I can name my mite too. Well, mine, mine, everyone, mine was Brian, name Veronica. Bruce's mite. Leave it in the comments below. <laughs> yeah, mine so, was yeah. Veronica, but that's like Veronica's big sister. So, is it bigger? Maybe like yeah. maybe Valerie the Varroa. Ooh, that sounds too nice. You guys drop drop comments in here, and we'll decide. Yeah. We'll Let's name Bruce's we'll Varroa mite. There, uh, I got to thank our buddy <laughs> Rob Pollock um, as well. For uh, the twenty dollars super chat, I really appreciate uh, everything uh, that Rob and and Lori do at Larabi's. Fantastic family, uh, making great vaporizers that are helping us zap.
critters just like this to keep our bees healthy as beekeepers help us uh, protect our investments. Um, so uh, I really appreciate you, Rob, and what you guys do at LaRabi's making this the absolute best of salic acid vaporizers. So thank you. Isn't isn't that supposed to be like a, almost to scale? If, if, if I were a bee, that's how big this thing would be on me, kind of theoretically. It, it's so that's how big cool. it that's how big it feels to the bee. And and someone on here asked where to get these. Brian, do you do you sell them on your website, or are you you the guy? You got them, don't you? Available, or what's what's the thing? What's the deal? So I do. Um, if if you want to get one, I'll just say this: email me, and there's a reason why. So, but I'll just say email me, and we'll make it work because I um, I had somebody contact me and uh theirs is in the package on the way so um if you're interested in one of those mites just uh you know email me at my email it's, it's on my my youtube page so it's just you know the brian.coper gmail but yeah so brian makes the best 3d printed stuff it is just it's always nice it's always crisp there's all there's so many details there we've got a uh, we're going to be featuring a lot of his um it's, it's really be art, um, Brian, uh, here at the Learning Yard, and we like to take these when we talk at clubs and such, too. So, Brian, I appreciate you doing that because that takes such an enormous amount of time to make those things. Um, so if you want to support a beekeeper who is uh, just doing an awesome job, definitely check out thecastlehives.com. That's the website, too. But if you want one of these very secret, very super secret top-notch ones, you have to email Brian. Guys, there's a lot Man. to talk about tonight when it comes to these packages um, and nukes. We're going to try to get through some of these different things, but there was a great comment. There's there's lots of great comments, uh, but Tom Nolan of uh, Nod Apiary. Uh, I'm curious if packages have an advantage when it comes to starting off with low or low mites. I suspect you cannot grow it easier down with no brood. That brings us into the next part of this conversation is which is healthier on the onset, a package or a nuke? Brian, what do you think? Oh, man. I mean, that's almost a loaded question just because... Me? A loaded question? Well, oh I would want to... If I don't know who set up the nuke then really it's it's you're just taking a i mean you're taking a, a risk at purchasing that nuke you don't know really equipment you don't know how old you know the frames are you don't know anything about it so you know there could be a risk there now if i were purchasing a nuke from you i i personally wouldn't i don't think there's any risk involved at all because I know that, you know, everybody knows, you know, Greg and, and Greg, you're, you're, yeah, you have your business, but you also, you care about your customers and you want your customers to succeed. So you're not selling your customers just any old nuke just to sell it. You know, you're selling them an established colony of bees that, you know, like we've all spoken already, you know, you have all stages of brood, you have everything is just set up and they're set up for success. So there's very little risk there, you know, packages, at least me, just because I'm, I'm familiar with them and I'm familiar with the process of how to install them and what you have to do, you know, as far as feeding and things like that. Um, I haven't really, I've never lost a package so, you know, for folks to um, worry that they got a package and while they don't have, you know, the frames of stores and this and that, and, you know, I've never lost one just because, you know, there are set, you know, there are things you have to do, but, you know, even, even with a nuke, there are things that you have to do. You have to watch them and, you know, I mean, just some of that is, is, as a beekeeper, you have to own some of your mistakes. And if you don't properly manage things, well, you might run into, you know, a situation, but um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's dependent on the situation, you know, really, or, or it's just, it's dependent on where you get 
said nuke from, where you get said package from, I guess. That's a, I mean, that's, that's just a challenge is when, when the answer to some of these questions are, it depends. There's a, so much nuance that a lot of customers aren't even aware of. And um, it, it definitely makes a huge difference. I want to thank Ron Slanska for that $20 super chat. Really do appreciate you uh, taking the time out to not only listen tonight on the Nature's Image Farm podcast, the stream team beekeeping chat live, and also this video in the replay. We appreciate you guys. And Ron, thanks for that donation. There's a, it's like every question we ask, it opens up another can of worms um, that gets to be very, very tricky. And I'm going to, um, I never want to speak from a place of, um, of posturing. I never want to speak in a place to belittle or to put down um, what others do or what other approaches um, what that approach might look like for somebody. So tonight when we talk about these things as uncomfortable and as uh, ugly as some of the things we're going to dig into are, I just want you guys to know that we're not intentionally stepping on anyone's toes. We're not trying to be ugly. We're not trying to take food off of somebody else's table. We'd never do that. Um, but this is an interesting conversation and how nukes and packages are created and put in the marketplace are widely different and the qualities are through the roof which i think is why there are so many different opinions on which is better because we in no way shape even if we were comparing nukes across the country we're comparing apples and oranges uh why we're on the topic of health um tom brought uh the might conversation into this and so let's maybe start there if we're just looking at a package of bees um, or a nucleus colony, a package could have phoretic mites on them for sure. And those phoretic mites could be imparting viruses to the bees. But what a package doesn't have is any comb. It doesn't have a mama varroa mite hiding behind a cap cell, hatching four or five babies out. So exponentially speaking, uh, oxalic acid vaporization of a package early on is a fantastic way to clean them up. One thing that we recommend for everyone who buys packages is that you do install them. And once she is out and laying and before that brood is sealed to go ahead and continue or start your oxalic acid treatment, one or two rounds, four days apart prior to those cells being capped is one of the best ways to get that colony clean. Now, if those bees do have viruses from wherever they came from that it could a affect their entire lifespan which a package of bees you don't know you don't know how old those bees are that are in that package is there some nurse bees in there sure are there some drones sure are there some old field force and worker bees in there sure so when you get a package you could have some initial die-off um, one of the ch most challenging things with packages is getting them from a supplier who takes care of the bees on the transport a lot of times you can get a package where half of the bees are dead and you've got inches of dead bees in the bottom of a package. That's no good. That, that, that is beyond the bees were just all old and died. However, you have to always anticipate and always expect for there to be some dead bees in the bottom of a package, um, just like there would be in a nuke. The difference is a nuke, um, the, the package, for example, you could have some bees that are at the end of their lifespan in that package, and they literally just expire in the package. Um, they could be close to their lifespan, and, and the stress of transport and moving and being shook was enough to get them uh, to where that's it. They're done. The, do bees die in nukes? Sure. You, you, you're gonna find, you could find a sprinkling of dead bees, 5, 6, 10, 20, um, in the bottom of a nuke, too, from old bees. But there's usually a lot less stress on transporting nukes if they're transported correctly. Um, then also there, there can be stress uh, transporting packages too. But where else does, it, where does this health conversation go? It goes a little bit further than just mites too. And this is where this gets a little bit sticky. And I'm, fellas, I'm a little apprehensive on going down this road. Um, but I, I think it's worth bringing it up in conversation and then we'll just let the folks listening um, take it for what it is. And, and Bruce, I'm thinking about you um, too right now, um, but there are, there are a few nuke schemes that are out there across the country. 
I shouldn't say schemes because that's kind of that's kind of derogatory. But nukes are built differently. Um, what a lot of what what some folks do is they will buy a a load of bees that just came home from the almonds. They'll bring them home. They will put a uh, a queen in a cage inside of the box. They'll put all that into a jester transport box. They'll sell those to their customers as the queen is caged for her protection. Take this nuke home. Don't touch it for 10 to 14 days. And I've got a real problem with that because that is extremely misleading. Uh, there is a certain community of folks, I'll say, in the Midwest and Eastern Midwest that have uh, their community as a whole have a very holistic um, and organic personification to them. And many of the folks in those communities uh, are doing that. They are buying almond bees, whether they're sick or healthy. They're splitting them out. They're out adding caged queens. They're closing up the box and are recommending that the customers who are going there to buy these what they think are clean, holistic bees made off of these farms, uh, they're not supposed to go home and touch these bees for two weeks. Well, why? a lot of folks, when they're first starting, they have no idea what that's about. A outside of, and this is going to be, this is going to get extremely, this conversation could get extremely caustic, so we'll stay away from it. But I'll refer to our mutual friend, Bob Benny, talking about the synergies of a hive. Synergies when you are mixing treatments with things like uh, any kind of uh, fungal sprays, not outside of miticides, but fungicides, any component that could be residing in that wax from wherever they came from that could have a negative synergy or a synergistic reaction. You don't know that when you're getting a nuke. There's a lot of folks when they're, when they're getting a nuke, if they don't know, we hear it, we, we, it's, it's easy for us to have the conversation and say, know your food, know your farmer, right? But a lot of folks don't know their bee farmers very well, if at all. Mm -hmm. They're buying nukes at because they're they're looking at the lowest price. They're looking wherever they can source them, but they really don't know how those bees are raised. They don't know the beekeeper behind it, and that can be a real challenge. Yes, mites can be phoretically on a package of bees, but guess what? In nukes, they can not only be phoretic, they can also be behind cap cells, and it could be absolutely loaded full of a big problem coming your way. There could also be synergistic things that you don't quite know yet. And the reason why I bring that up is Bruce just mentioned it a little bit ago. Folks buying nukes that were already sick, folks can't figure out why they're going downhill, why they're crashing, why they're dying. These are supposed to be nukes. These are supposed to be a healthy snapshot of a healthy colony to help folks get off to a good start and they can't wrap their head around why is my colony dying. There are a lot of reasons that that actually could be. So just because it's a nuke does not mean that it is the healthiest picture of a colony. It can 100% be somebody else's problem. If where mm -hmm. those bees came from were sick and diseased, uh, if they were full of chalk brood, foul brood, you name it, you're getting somebody else's problem. Well, how do you know if you're getting clean bees or not? That's a conversation that you need to have with your supplier. Yeah. If, 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 if it's not an option for you to go out there and see where the bees come from, I would be a little bit concerned. So from the health standpoint alone, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Very, very complicated. Um, so Bruce, what, what are your thoughts on the potential uh, for disease transmission and health uh, of the colony comparing a package to a nuke? Well, I think it's, <clears throat> I think the obvious answer is that you're probably, I mean, I think, you probably have more of a, if they've already got brood in there, if they've got the um, an established colony, you, you probably, obviously a lot of the diseases and problems happen in the, in the comb, in the brood. So if you already have brood in there, it could be sick. Um, likewise, you know, you could buy packages of bees that are sick too, theoretically, if they've passed some viruses around through mite, mite loads or whatever. So it is very complicated. I like to let people come and look at the nukes that I sell. Um, and I don't sell, I haven't sold a lot. Now, if I get to where I'm selling in the future from a commercial standpoint, you know, hundreds of nukes a year, whatever, you know, or if people, if I'm delivering nukes and things like that, then I have to make some decisions. But typically the way I've done it in the past is if I have 
15 nukes I want to sell, I just say, hey, come out there and check it out and take whichever ones you want. And I'll let them pick the ones they want. And I'll try and walk through. If it's a new beekeeper, I say, hey, look, you know, this queen right here, she's she's a new queen from this year. And you see she's laying up all these eggs. These This comb is full of eggs right now. There's not as much cat brood, but in two weeks or three weeks, this thing's going to explode. I really think you'll be real pleased. Or we look in there and we say, well, there's nothing but a lot of bees and a lot of brood in here. I, I just kind of try to walk them through what they're seeing mm-hmm. and let them know. Obviously, more experienced beekeepers can take a look. And you can kind of tell, honestly, like if I go look in a colony, I can tell if it's a healthy colony or not just looking in there i can't see in the wax i can't see every particle that's in the wax none of us can but you can tell by looking at the bees the way they act you can see if there's a bunch of chalk brood or a bunch of sick brood Um, you can see a lot of things by looking in the colony dead bees if they're dirty bees you know if it's dirty Mm -hmm. in the bottom of the nuke box or whatever so you can kind of tell with experience i i think you can for the most part you can tell a healthy colony or not but i would be real leery of someone that that sold me a nuke and said don't open it for two weeks my goodness Mm -hmm. i'm like are you kidding me there's no way i wouldn't even consider that to me that's just and then of course those same people will probably say there's no guarantee so you go and you you know you get 20 nukes from someone and then you know five or six of them die and uh and there's no guarantee i'm like that would be you know that's how a lot of those people probably operate you know there's no guarantees with bees type of a thing there's no way on earth i would ever purchase a colony or a nuke from someone that says be sure you don't open it for two weeks Mm -hmm. are you kidding me that would be crazy i've never i've never heard of that oh i Mm -hmm. know i've never i've never actually heard anyone say that but i I do know that that a lot of uh, folks getting into bees don't really know what they're looking for when they see a nuke because i've seen pictures of nukes online of people selling nukes and you know some of them have like one or two bees in the middle and they're selling them as five frame nukes and i'm like what are you doing you know and then other people most people i think are fairly honest and they sell nukes that are packed out or they look really good and so it's just uh it is i think with nukes you have a lot more room for error and um i think you do i think but if you it's really what brian said you got to kind of know the person be willing to talk to the person mm-hmm. they've got to be willing to talk to you about what you're getting and explain kind of what the origin of that nuke was i, I just think that's important to be able to have that conversation and uh if you're not if they're not willing to talk to you about it then i don't i'd probably turn the other way it's kind of like going and buying a car and they just want to give you the keys and want you to drive off without test driving or looking at that car i mean it's a similar type concept you need to know what you're getting because it's not cheap i mean the cheapest nicks no. you're going to find if you're just buying if you're buying one or two you know down here you can get them for a little cheaper than up there you can get them for 150 or so 160 bucks um if you're buying just a couple to get started or sometimes a little bit more depending on the beekeeper but still that's a lot of money for someone getting started they've already put all the money into the equipment and it's it's not a cheap thing to get into even in most probably think nationwide you're looking at 180 200 bucks minimum for a nuke in most places that's a pretty big investment for, some, for someone so yeah, I the, think the it's further, just important I mean, to, yeah, I think it's just important to, to get to know the person you're dealing with and uh, mm-hmm. roll that way. And I, you know, I know that you mentioned right. the concern about the synergistic problems with the wax and things like that. Um, I don't know that I've had that much of a problem in the past. I, 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 you and I talked about this from the pollination bees because I had some loss this year. We talked about it pretty extensively. I really have kind of narrowed down. I think I had some issues with mites in those colonies because I didn't treat last spring and they bounced back pretty strong here in the fall. So I, it's possible, I guess. But even if you're doing pollination, I think it's important to know what the farmers are doing. You know, hopefully you're out there in a, you really, it is a risk when you send them out there and you're not there with them. But you hope you can trust your farmers and your brokers not to, not to spray something that's going to mess with your bees out there. But I, I know you don't know for sure. There's no way to know for sure what's going on out there. So. Um, but I, yeah. I feel like most farmers of almonds and different crops, if they're paying to have bees there, they want the beekeeper to come back the next year. So they would try to at least, you know, be careful with the bees there until they leave. But I, I might be wrong on that. Yeah, Bruce, mm-hmm. Tom brings up a great point here. Let's let's just put it out there that some people use nuke sales to get rid of their old and contaminated frames. Um, unfortunately, that's, that's pretty common practice. Um, there's a difference between cycling out your frames to keep your operation in that, you know, one to two and three year phase. And, uh, you know, people do use nuke sales to get rid of the old stuff, but you shouldn't be buying black frames. If you're buying black frames, a foundation, 
that that's a problem. Um, I'm a firm believer, and this, again, this is just because this this is the way that I do it. I'm not saying this is the best or the only way to do it. But when I sell somebody a Nuka Bees, when I crack open that lid, my heart goes pitter patter, and I have to check myself before I wreck myself because I almost say, "Oh man, that box of bees is too good. I want to go put that in an out yard. I, I want to keep that for my growth. I want to keep that." Those are the boxes of bees that you should be selling. A box that you're so proud of that you want to keep. That's the kind of mm-hmm. nukes that should be going out. That's same thing with queens. You should have spent enough time with that queen to say, hey, this queen is just laying up a storm. Look how beautiful she is. This is a queen that I want for myself. Those are the bees that you want to be selling to folks. Um, and so, but not everyone does it that way. There are some folks who literally um, just, to be very clear, and so I, I have to make a distinction here because it could almost sound hypocritical. And I, I own that. We are distributors of packages. We buy package bees from the south. At our risk, we transport them up north to get folks that early opportunity. Those are not our bees. We do not have Georgia out yards. Okay. So to be clear, we are reselling packages. However, this is where public misconception with nukes is an important thing to bring up because while I just said I'm a distributor of packages, there are some folks who are distributor of nukes. They're not their bees. They're not their boxes. They literally just bought two or three or 400 nukes for $125 off a commercial grower. They bring those boxes up. They put them in their out yard. They sell them as nukes. Is that right? Is that wrong? It's not for me to answer. For me, that's not how I do things. Uh, Where this gets challenging is what the consumer's perception and expectation is for the nuke. Is that still a nucleus colony? Is it three to five frames of bees with a mated queen in it? Probably so. But if those bees are being sold as local to a state or local to a certain beekeeper and and they're buying nukes to flip, well, hey, that's a conversation you need to have with your nuke provider and you also need to rein in and maybe better understand what are my expectations? What do I actually want from a nuke? So at the same time, again, we are distributors of packages, but we're not distributors of nukes. We're growing those bees out here and selling those off of our farm. That's completely different. <clears throat> um, and so that there is um, there's a distinction there and it gets a little bit sticky. I want to thank uh, Kenneth Bach. For the $20 super chat, I really do appreciate that. That really helps us out uh, big time. So thank you for that $20 super chat. Guys, as you can see, it doesn't take long before we can start to get a little controversial um, and really start to ruffle some feathers. Um, but the fact of the matter is, you know, I'm sure these nuances are, um, they occur across the country, no matter what state that you're in. You get into certain nuances, though, when you're up north, Uh, northern midwest northeastern parts of the country where we have a great challenge raising bees early and soon enough to get started when you're down in bruce's neck of the woods or georgia or florida you really you can start growing bees so quick that the i wouldn't say that the demand isn't quite as great um, but you'll find nukes that might be 145 dollars to 160 dollars all day long and packages might be the same exact price a lot of it has to do with the availability uh, and the seasonality um, of those products, too. Um, can I? Greg, sure, can go I ahead, Bruce. Here? Um, first of all, you know, I've seen some people in the comments saying, preach it. And I see one there from a short pants beef farm that says, truth is truth. And I, I want you, Greg, to, to remember, we talked about this a little bit after the last live chat, that, you know, sometimes things get a little bit, we're passionate about what we're doing here, right? And, um, you're passionate. We each are in our own way for what we're doing. And so I think that's what we need to hear more of in the beekeeping world. I know Cayman's passionate and he lets his, you know, passion come through. And so, and so many of us are, so we're just trying to be straight up honest with everyone. And, and I think that's how we, how we kind of help people, how we come to our decisions as to what we're doing. I've definitely changed how I'm doing things since I've been involved with the stream team and just, you know, getting to know other beekeepers around the country and I'm equally as passionate as anybody, but, but I'm willing to listen too. And I think people want to hear that and they want to kind of get 
you know, some strong opinions as opposed to someone that's just trying to tell them what they want to hear all the time. And so I appreciate you kind of getting on that soapbox occasionally, Greg, and, and letting us know what you think. And you, you call it, I think, preaching, and that's okay. Whatever you want to call it, that's what we need to hear. And I appreciate you being passionate about what you've seen mm-hmm. and what you're doing. And uh, I would say, too, that, that when it comes to the old comb, you know, I saw a video from Cayman probably uh, two or three years ago, four years ago. And uh, I had not been real good about changing out my comb in my colonies. And uh, he, he showed us some pretty dark comb and, and talked about how, you know, it, it still was probably okay. And he hadn't had any issues with that. And so I do have some pretty dark comb in my colonies, but, when I sell a nuke, if I, I don't sell many once again, I'm still that's that's the game I'm kind of trying to get into now a little bit in the next couple or three years. I'm I'm really got my sights set on some maybe some selling some bees, maybe selling some queens. And and um if you buy a nuke from me, um, which I'm not announcing that I'm selling nukes this year, otherwise I'll get way more demand than what I could possibly uh, provide. But you know, it's gonna have every every frame in there is gonna have a purpose. It's gonna have at least one to two frames of basically wall-to-wall brood hopefully a nice brood, a laying pattern just a beautiful healthy laying pattern of brood um, at least uh, one frame of probably some open brood maybe some mixed brood in there maybe some capped and some open brood with some milk brood and eggs and so forth it's gonna have a nice frame of uh, food in there hopefully honey pollen and then another frame that's freshly drawn out and hopefully that queen's going to start laying in there as well. Depending on the season, you know, obviously if there's a good flow going, they're going to start packing food in there. But just just have all the different things that you need for a healthy colony. And um, so that's kind of what I'm looking at. If I were buying or selling a nuke, that's what I'm looking for. And so um, that's kind of where I, what I look at when I assess. Now, if I do get into the nuke uh, growing and selling uh, process, where then obviously, you know, you have to just – go through that comb so fast you're just throwing new foundation and then you're splitting and splitting and splitting and so it's, it's just a little more difficult to really cycle and get rid of comb when you're not selling bees you know what i mean it's kind of harder to do yeah. that and so some of my comb is maybe a little bit older than the one to two year old comb that you're talking about but but i do as it gets old if, if it looks really you know if it starts to look bad or if it's you know the wax moss skin or if it's just if it gets trashy looking i do burn it or i just get rid of it i don't I, people say melt it down my melted down comb from that old black comb my black from that old black comb it never looks like i want it to look and so i usually just usually end up just kind of burning those frames and getting rid of them or scraping it off or doing something with them but eventually it gets to that point but but some of my comb isn't the prettiest nice fresh brand new you know in my nicks that i sell it's not always just that one or two year old comb it's sometimes it's a little bit older just well, there's kind of there's the around. there's something to the the comb. There is is the 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 wax in a colony has been said is it's the filter. It's it's the lung of the colony, and at at some point, um, there was you know there's been testing done that um, even um, off of brand fresh one day old wax that the bees are sweating and turning into comb, and that comb is collected and tested. There are synthetics and there are chemicals found inside that wax well why is that how is that what is it how bad is it the fact of the matter is the older the wax is the more potential contaminants that it can contain um sure. brian is uh, on course to um get his uh, master's beekeeper um, certification with the university of florida brian what are your thoughts on old comb and there you go and, and how does that pertain to the health of a colony, do you think? Oh, man. You know, I, I've i heard, it goes back to you ask a group of beekeepers, you know, a question and you get so many different answers. I've heard some folks say they're using the same comb from 20 years. You know, they've used the same frames. Um what I always do is I tend to just eyeball it. If things just to me just don't look right with the frames, I just scrape it. Um, I never have then melted it down to do anything with it. It just goes in the trash. Um, I, this last year now that was my sixth season 
some of my original frames, I scraped them all, whichever frames I had in, you know, inside of my honey house and was stored, I scraped them all down and cleaned them up pretty good just to give things a fresh start. You know, it, and, and I simply did that just from hearing everyone talk about, you know, everything that's out in the environment. And because now I've been using oxalic acid a lot and the possible reactions with other, you know, whether it's fungicides, other pesticides, whatever it is, I just took that in that, well, I want to eliminate that risk. So I scraped them some frames. I'll probably swap out some frames this year just to, you know, eliminate that. Um, but that's just from me hearing people talk. Um, if, you know, I, and then I'm sure through my studies, I'm sure I'll probably learn a little bit more. You know, I, I know there's probably research out there on this topic. So I need to dig that up. But what I've always done is just eyeball things. If I think that frames just look nasty, I just pull it, you know, it's, it's, it's a frame, you know, what's one frame going to hurt if you go through and now this is from a hobbyist perspective. If you have a handful of colonies and you go through and you do your inspections and you find X number of frames, that looks bad, pull them, pull them, scrape them. And, you know, if there's whatever, if there's stores on them, you know, pull it out, let the bees rob it out and clean it up and then scrape it and, you know, toss it back in. Um, that's just yeah. been like my, my plan, so to say, of what I've followed. So one thing, and I think that, yeah, this is, yeah, that's the comment I was going to go back to from Tom there. Mm. You know, when you go in, if you go into cutouts, if you guys notice this, you go into a cutout, this maybe the, maybe it's the same colony that's been there for three years, or maybe they died out or swarmed out and another one moved in, but you will always see white, fresh wax in there. And then you, if it's an old spot, you'll see old black comb that the bees are not touching. And so they will begin to ignore that comb over time. And um, if that starts happening, I just, then it's time to, for sure. I, I'm not saying I keep my comb in there forever, but, but I am saying that you can, you can just kind of, Brian, like you say, you can kind of tell sometimes if mm -hmm. the, if the, if the, uh, by the time the, um, cells begin to get smaller looking and turn around, you know, it's time, it's probably time to get it out of there. Then it's probably been too long in there, you know? And so, because they will, and for those who may not know, as the, as the queen lays uh, the eggs in there and those larvae hatch and form, you know, become baby bees, it's almost like they spin a cocoon in there is what I like to call it. Mm -hmm. And over time, those cocoons just kind of build up in there. And after time, after a while, the bees just cannot utilize it and nor should they utilize it. Then it's time for it to go even sooner than that. Obviously mm -hmm. it's time to go. And so I am definitely going to become more, what's that word? Intentional about being Good more word. careful about my comb and trying to maybe start cycling mm -hmm. more of that out. I've just been trying to grow so much over the years that I just, that comb is so valuable. It's hard to just, you know, when you're trying to grow and grow, it's hard to keep going back and trying to cycle that out. But if I do get into new cells, I will definitely be, you know, comb is going to be something I'm going to go through. I'm going to be going through much faster. And so that's kind of, that's one of the things I'm looking at and trying to figure out how to do in the future. And, and uh, talking to you, Greg, and when Tom was down here, we talked about it just a little bit. Um, I know I've seen, like Brian says, both sides of that equation. I've, I've listened to, to both sides of that argument and, um, it wax definitely it. That's one of the beautiful things about bees is that it's like a filter, you know, it, it, it's, it's just amazing. All the different ways of that colony, all the built-in mechanisms of safety and protection that that hive has in there, uh, that, that colony of bees has, it's just amazing. The propolis, the wax, uh, even the ability to cycle air through the colony and clean it out. Uh, it's just so amazing what the bees can do, plus their natural immunity that they have. It's just unbelievable. And it, it is a, it's a creation of a, a, of a divine creator. There's no doubt about it. It's amazing to see all the things that they do in there. And it's, it's also um, incredible to be able to see and experience some of the nuances that you see inside of a colony. 
and to be in tune enough to a colony to whether you know for not or whether you know for certain one way or the other if dark comb is bad or if if uh, fresh comb is better i love what what the some of the comments here is when you see that colony and the the worker cells are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and those bees and you've seen it the bees come out and they're smaller and you might say oh look at me i've got small cell bees all of a sudden sometimes that comb can get so small that that those the the larva and the pupa and the bees that are emerging out of there are a little bit smaller. That's it's usually one of the first signs that man, it is was time to get this comb out, out the door there. a long time ago because that mm -hmm. those bees are going to have some performance issues. So it's neat to be able to be in tune enough with your bees and what they're doing to pick up on that. So that's definitely another concern with comb. I would hope um, that a lot of folks are not doing that. Um, I've only bought nukes a few times. And there are, and we're going to talk about it still, uh, yet to come in tonight's conversation. Uh, if you're tuning in, the Nature's Image Farm podcast, if you're checking out the stream team beekeeping chat live or the replay, there's a lot yet to come tonight, including what's the difference between an overwintered nuke and a spring nuke? Is one better than the other? What are they? Are they oversold? Are they undersold? Are there some opportunities? Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to talk uh, yet tonight, uh, which will be ready for winter, a package or a nuke. And do genetics matter? Uh, there's a lot, lot to uncover, I think, with all these things. Mm -hmm. And when is it a good idea to buy bees? Uh, there are some fantastic opportunities by, by buying bees. And we're going to talk about what that is, what that looks like. But first, I'm going to thank Matt Kirkland for that $5 super sticker. Really do appreciate that. Guys, I could sit and talk about some of these things. Like every topic we've talked about tonight, I could spend two hours on. Um, fortunately for everybody listening, I get too <laughs> fired up if I spend too much time. Um, and I, I'm always trying to be mindful that once words leave your gums, there are no taking them back. And so I'm always trying to be mindful just because I am passionate and I may do have some opinions that, I, that I'm trying to share these thought processes as unbiasedly as possible. Um, and so, again, if I've stepped on your toes, if I've hurt your feelings, if I've ruffled some feathers, I'd like to just maybe just say maybe it's like when you're sitting in that wood pew during church service and grandpa's the preacher and you're wondering, why is grandpa always picking on me? Well, maybe there's something that we need to work on here. Um, Brian. With your experience with package bees, um, in the past, you had some, some bees that didn't pull through the winter like you hoped. You charged those dead outs with packages and got them off to a good start. And those bees cruised through and they made it through the winter and they came out and they were prolific and, and amazing and awesome. There's a mm -hmm. lot of misconception that I'm just going to say it and we're going to get it out of the way. A lot of folks, boy... I gotta be careful here, fellas. A lot of folks who sell nukes only will say, "Don't waste your money on on junk southern bees that won't make it through the winter and they won't make any honey." And then you'll have folks that only are distributors of packages, and they say, "Don't buy nukes; it's somebody else's problem. What you want is fresh, clean bees, and you want our package bees because they're cheaper and available earlier." I hear this and I see this all the time and it is, it's, it's just, it's one of those things. One of the things that you'll hear very often is that beginning beekeepers should never harvest honey in their first year. Brian, what, what's been your experience with packages? Um, not only how prolific can they be and is there some honey you can harvest even off a package? Yep. I, when I got my packages from you two years ago, um, now just to, just so everybody knows, like Greg said earlier, I set them up. They, they had drawn comb. So when I installed the packages, they had frames of honey. There was, you know, bee bread pollen. So they were set up really, I was, you know, dumping a package of bees in frames that were already set up. I had picked a lot of the dead bees 
out of them. So there, there was a few left, but not much. So I tried to clean up my dead outs to the best that I could so that then when I installed those packages, they took off. I think when I had checked it, it was five or six days after I had installed the packages, put the queens in, and in all of my you know colonies that I had set up, but one, there were eggs. So literally within days, those queens were released, there were eggs. They then built up, you know, and I had double deeps and harvested that season. Now, I had that comb on them, but, you know, if you have been beekeeping for several years, we all know drawn comb is worth gold. So if you simply, you know, purchase a package, yes, you can harvest. But one thing that I always do, though, also, and just just to throw this out there, some people might say, oh, well, you know, probably, you know, pulled some honey out of the deeps. I never in this will be my seventh season. I have never spun any of my frames in my deeps. That is for the bees and I never touch it. The only honey that I will ever spin comes from the supers and that's it. So yes, you can, but then it goes into, you know, I'm, I'm going to back step a little bit and it goes, uh, plays, you know, into effect. How did you manage things? You know, so there's a lot of variables in there, but you can, if you manage them properly, you can definitely harvest from a package. You know, I, I say 100% you can, you know, it's, but, it's done commonly. And you mentioned it. It's all mm -hmm. about management. Um, we had uh, some folks last year bought packages and showed me photos and photos of buckets and buckets and buckets. Yeah. Of honey and that's where packages do have an advantage to nukes is a package started off in april um they're gonna she's they're gonna start laying they're gonna start building up they're gonna be in that that vibe that that colony has at the time the flow hits and so the packages are usually going to be in place balanced settled out and in that growing stage of their life cycle when that flow like in ohio hits and those packages can get on it those packages are going to be present for multiflora rose and for black locust and for some of those cherries. They're going to be there at the, that early timing where nukes won't be. Nukes are getting built out and growing at our farm on that flow. And that's what helps continue to get them nice and healthy and, mm -hmm. and build up. So, yes, packages 100% can and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to get a lot of flack for it, but there are times where you 100% or at least 99.5% should be pulling honey off a package and a nuke in the first year. And if you were paying attention at all to any of the beekeepers in the Midwest, especially the Ohio area, we were so overwhelmed with nectar in the spring that we were pulling honey out of our mating nukes. That's a problem for us. Um, but that is an incredible blessing for folks who got started last year with packages because the bees, they were just so abundant. So there are lots of opportunities to pull honey. Yes, off packages uh, and even um, off of nukes. I've got a question here that I've got starred. Um, I want to thank everybody for um, all your comments and your questions. I am trying to stay uh, in tune with them all, but I am doing a very uh, poor job there, flying by quick, and uh, I'm not real good at multitasking, so I'm, I'm engaged and listening to Bruce and Brian, and I'm not able to uh, catch up um, on all the comments. Um, but the, uh, the, the question was uh, from our buddy Rob Pollock at LaRobbie's. Uh, Greg, I know you've mentioned it a little. Uh, when will your first learning yard of the year be? Uh, you really invest your time and energy back into your customers. Rob, first, I appreciate you saying that. Rob and Lori drove all the way out uh, from the Maryland uh, Shores area to come all the way out to Ohio uh, to bring back nukes. Now, I said nukes, not packages, and then we're going to talk about that next. Why would anyone drive halfway across the country to go buy a nuke when they have a nuke that's available 
in someone else's backyard, um, we're going to talk about that. Uh, Rob, to answer your question, the learning yard is going to get kicked off here the 1st of April. There are so many fun things going on right now that I cannot wait to show everybody. If you were at the learning yard last year, I can't wait for you to see what we've been busy doing. Uh, I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag yet, but we've been busy uh, to uh, provide a space to make uh, more and provide more opportunities for hands-on learning, not only in the classroom, uh, we're there with all of our supplies, but right there out in the learning yard. It's going to be awesome. So, Rob, I would say the 1st of April, we're going to get that kicked back off again. Hope to see you there. It brings up a, a great question is, why would someone, and we right like this year we have folks that are driving 12, 14, 16 hours um, to pick up four to 20 nukes. Why in the world would they do that? Now, it's not because of this face, because I've got a face for radio. Um, it's, it's not because um, we have some kind of a magical bee that we're overselling to do all these magical jobs inside of a colony that they're going to stay forever healthy with, with no approach. Bruce, why do you think folks would travel halfway across the country to pick up nukes from us? Why do you think folks would have us ship queens all across the country? end of the bee yard when they have locally available stock in their neck of the woods. What are your thoughts on that, Bruce? I think there are several reasons. Um, number one, obviously is they trust you, the quality, especially if they've uh, heard testimonies from folks like myself and Brian and others who have purchased from you in the past. And, uh, you know, they've seen it through your, uh, YouTube channel and your podcast, and they've seen just various things and they know what you're trying to do. But I would say an equally uh, big reason or an e equally uh, significant reason, if not even a bigger reason, is because people understand that you care. They understand your passion and they know that you care about them. They feel like you're going to give them the best quality because they trust you and your family and what you're doing. And uh, I echo that sentiment. You know, obviously, I bought, got some queens for me last year and it's because I trust you. And I think that's the biggest reason. And uh, they, they believe that, that when they buy a product from you, it's going to be quality. And uh, they, but I think a lot of it is, once again, it's the community. They appreciate the learning yard. They appreciate the willingness that you have to share and to develop those relationships. And that's really what business is all about, is providing a quality product and developing relationships with the customers. And I think people really appreciate that. I know I do. And, um, you know, obviously, they're, that right here in this area, probably within a few miles of here, I can find queens. I can find things I need. Um, but I do like to try uh, queens and, and products from other parts of the country just to, if for no other reason, to introduce genetics, uh, different genetics here. But, but you know, I it would be fun if I could get up there for one of those learning art things. I think people, you, you've created kind of like a an environment there and a, uh, I don't know what, it's a community really. And um, you know, the, on the field of dreams, if you build it, they will come. And I think that's kind of what you guys are doing with your nature's image farm, uh, homestead there with, with the uh, learning yard and, and the products you're selling. Well, Bruce, I, I appreciate you saying that. And that it, it's humbling to hear you say something like that. Um, I was actually trying to steer you, uh, to, to a, a completely different response, but I, that was beautiful. And that, that well, really, it makes I, all the difference when, when folks uh, believe in us. No, and um, I think, I think us. I kind of blew over probably the as much or more important thing is the quality of the product that you're selling. You know, yeah. obviously I, I, maybe that's what you're looking for, but I do agree with that. I think that, you know, just what we've talked about tonight, just obviously you care about what you're doing and you're going to, you're not going to sell junk. That's, that's my biggest fear. That's one reason I've been so hesitant to sell, you know, nukes and queens and whatever is just because I don't want to sell junk. And I just, I worry that, that, you know, even if it looks good when it leaves my bee yard, I just worry about that. I don't have the confidence yet. If I have junk, if I have hives that crash in my bee yard, I can, I can take care of it and I don't have to live with it. But if I sell someone a nuke that crashes two months later, then I, I would feel horrible about that. And so, but I think that you have, you've developed the skills and the talent and the, the knowledge over the time with the people you've hung out with the greats of the industry that you have that confidence in that, that tremendous product that you're selling now that people trust, they really trust you on that. And I think that's one reason people drive up there as well. Well, I, I, I 
we, we say bees are, are the conduit um, to the people and it, it's the most rewarding thing. Uh, yes, it's handy to be able to pay the light bill. It's handy to be able to pay the mortgage on the farm and for the tractor. Um, but one of the most rewarding things is to make that viable connection with somebody else um, to just be a part of that. We, there, there's a new nickname going around that uh, Greg is a bee evangelist which I think is pretty funny. Um, it, it's probably the most accurate statement. Be evangelism uh, 2023 might, might be a real deal. When you're able to meet people where they're at, you know, uh, you can share your experience. You, it, it's a heart to heart kind of a thing. It's not for everybody. Some people are just here for the bees and that's totally cool. Um, but there, there are so many opportunities where we can just support one another in our walk and in our journey. And uh, God has put us in an amazing position to be able to do that. Um, so Bruce, again, I, I appreciate uh, all the kind words that you have to say about us and our family. The same thing that Brian says too. I really appreciate you guys. One of the one of the points that I wanted to bring up is that there are obviously I, I, I'm going to stop saying this statement, but there are lots of different opinions when it comes to some of these things, and I I, I, re, I appreciate and respect all those. The fact of the matter is, it's it's a very good idea to buy bees. For a lot of reasons, uh, and then for the right reasons. If it's a matter of trust and you want to support somebody because you trust that they're creating good bees for you and they're going to do well, totally cool. But one thing that I want to consider, folks, that I want folks to consider is I've had conversations this week with, with two great, great guys in my neck of the woods, and they uh, are starting off beekeeping, and their bees did awesome last year. They were part of the learning yard. They're fantastic dudes to start with. They're, they're, they dig in. They're dedicated. Now they have a problem, kind of like Brian. Now they have all these bees that are living and thriving and surviving and getting ready to explode in the spring, and now they don't know what to do. What, so what does their growth plan look like? What does their strategy look like? And this is where the rubber meets the road. And I said, fellas, you really got to spend some time here and you have to dig in and understand what is it you want out of this beekeeping journey? If it's a hobby that you're throwing money at, cool. It sure is a heck of a lot better than golf. If this mm -hmm. is a hobby that you want to pay for itself, you're going to sling a little honey, right? And you're going to cover your cost. Cool. If this is turning into a business, then this is where I'm going to challenge your thinking. And this is where I think buying bees is a fantastic idea. You've heard the saying, uh, buy boxes, build bees. I'm not arguing with that. But the fact of the matter is there are a lot of folks who are very ambitious and they want to grow faster than the bees that they have in their yard to grow with. Whether that's a good approach or a bad approach, that's not for me to judge. But I am going to tell you, there are a lot of folks who get a very fast and good grip on what's going on in the bee yard and they are able to grow at an accelerated rate. In this situation, they are buying bees to exponentially grow. That, so there is an opportunity there, number one. Number two, there's an opportunity when you know you want to grow a yard and you have enough wisdom, foresight, or a mentor who will shoot straight with you and say, before you do anything and grow your yard, start with the best genetics that you can find. Start there. That will save you five years or 10 years of trying to grow out and develop a beeline from what you're working with that will never get there. That's a fact. Genetics do matter. Will all these bees go do what they're supposed to do? Forage, multiply, make honey? Yes, they will. But keep them healthy and keep them clean. Will they do it? 100%. But the fact of the matter is, once you start digging in to under the hood of what's going on inside of a colony, using genetics as, as, a, as a performance altering tool is a big deal. If you are growing your yard, bringing in nukes, what are you getting with nukes? Yeah, you're getting a queen of that genetic line that you're looking for. But here's something that nobody talks about. What's as important to a yard that is growing? What is drones. as important as the queen? The drones. The drones. Bingo. That is a huge thing and a very often overlooked. Drones are so extremely important to the growth of any apiary when you are trying to really dial in on your genetics. It's a big deal. So buying nukes 100% is one of the smartest things that you can do 
when you are bringing in better genetics or you're tuning up your line, it's a big deal. And drones do matter. Greg, uh, I just wanted to mention that is probably something that really, I mean, I've kind of understood this concept the whole time, but I'm really trying to become laser focused on that. You know, I want to get uh, that if I'm going to ever sell Queens, I want to make sure the genetics are good. And and we've talked, you know, we talked one day for quite a while about how I could figure out a way to set up my bees in such a way that that I can flood them with the desirable drones that I want. And that is as important. I mean, it's, it's half of the actually it's maybe more important than the actual queen in some ways, because all the diversity from all those drones with all the drones that the queen mates with. And so it is absolutely as important as anything else to have the proper drones in the area and then after talking to you extensively and talking to kind of how you know we talked about even the configuration of how i could set up my bee yards and then i've talked to Corey or you know Corey a little bit about it and man i'm just excited to kind of that's kind of my next step is to figure out some bee yards and to maybe get some some really good genetic um stuff going on here i think i'm on my way my bees are already seeming this year as they're starting to grow to be a little better from an attitude perspective, I've always had some really strong bees, but, but if I can just kind of help get the attitude and the, the kind of tune in the traits a little bit, kind of get certain traits in the bees that I'm looking for a little better. I really think we could create a really good bee down here or, or mix with yours and some other stock and just, just have a really nice line of bees right here from this local area. Whereas historically the bees I've had, though some have been very strong, some have been not so nice and I've had some that were very, very good bees and some that were horrible bees just because I've, you know, I haven't been real careful or real intentional with my drones and the, and the bees I've had. And so, because it started from local stock and then it, a lot of swarms and things I've caught and splits off of those and just it's been local feral stuff. And, you know, obviously the bees that are here are here for a reason. They've survived here, especially the feral ones that you catch. But I think that you can introduce I think I'm kind of learning that you can take queens or genetics from another area and bring them in here and you can cross them with local stuff to some respect. You can end up with a much stronger stock yeah. with the desirable traits and survivor stock in your area. I think it is an incredible opportunity to create something really special here. And so that's kind of what I'm, that's really kind of where my brain is now. I've, I've made a lot of honey over the years. I've done some pollination stuff. I've tried a lot of things. But that's kind of where, you know, you talked about being intentional about kind of figuring out a business plan. That's kind of where I'm thinking about heading maybe in the next couple or three years as, I, as this thing grows. Um, as I create these new splits we're going to do in the next couple of weeks. And I hope to get more of your stock in and some other desirable stock in here and just see if we can create something special. Well, so that's, you hit the that, nail on the head with that. volumes, you know, to the, the sentiment of, of that statement that genetics matter. If, if genetics didn't matter you wouldn't go through the pain and aggravation of having different genetic lines brought in from all over the place. But what I like about that, Bruce, is you were in tune with the situation of your bees and you said, Hey, I, this, here's what my goals are. Here's what I would like to do. Can I do that with this stock? Whether the answer is yes or no, you decided to move forward and bring some of our stock down in there. Um, I, I enjoyed the photos uh, that you sent and, and, and some of the messages, Bruce, where those Pepto pinks are just exploding and they're getting ready to take off and do their thing. Talk to us a little bit, Bruce, about um, what you, th how important you think genetic diversity is going to be for you this coming year. And by focusing in, dialing into that, where is that going to take uh, your bee operation, do you think, in the next couple years? Well, I just, I'm super excited about it. Um, you know, I, I got, I ordered 20 from you. I ended up with 16. I think I didn't really have enough splits to do all 20. So we, you know, Lisa got a couple, you know, we got some, anyway, I ended up with 16 of your Queens and I've mentioned on here before that you remember that day, Greg, we were putting some of those Queens in a very difficult situation. It was not the best time of the year to be making splits and trying to reduce Queens. It was really during a dearth and it was really almost a, it was a very, <laughs> The bees were chippy and spicy more so even than usual because it was not a good time to be messing with bees. And so I put those queens in a very difficult situation. Um, some of them didn't have much food in there. They just, it was tough. And so some of the colonies, it's been kind of tough for them to, to get 
gain traction. You know, they, some of them really didn't grow much initially. Um, I've got some now that are still pretty small, but man, some of those things, and, and I actually, I think I lost a couple of them. They just weren't put in a good situation, but I will say that, that they are starting to kick it in gear right now. You know, we're starting to have some warmer days and, uh, I broke into one of my, and, and actually a video is going to probably drop either later tonight or tomorrow evening. Um, I went through some of the apple maze in my backyard on Monday, I think it was Monday. And I sent you a picture, a little bit of, I don't know if I sent you a video or just a picture of that, Greg, but man, yeah. just these bees are just, you know, it's a, it was a deep and a medium, the box they're in. And last year, remember Greg, it, it was a decent sized colony when we put her in there, but it wasn't a healthy colony really by any stretch. Um, it was not a, a very good colony, but they backed off for a while and took their time. But now that when I cracked that thing open, I haven't been in there in a couple of months, literally bees full of bees. They were calm. They're almost black. They're just beautiful. And it's just like, there's that harmony. You talked about the rhythm, I guess, on the frame, so to speak. I didn't yep. actually see the queen, but I'm telling you, they are going to just explode. And I'm excited to see how they do. And, uh, you know, I'm seeing that in some other areas of my, my bee arts too. But I have I had not been in them, and I was really excited to to get in them. And, and that's the first one I cracked into that day, and, and it did not disappoint. And I really had no idea what, I was, what to expect when I got on those colonies because they all looked active and busy as it's warmed up. They've been bringing in pollen. All the colonies out here have, and man, they're doing well. And that one is it's just such a nice looking colony and nice looking bees and just healthy and healthy and happy. So if you want to see how they look, guys, I'm going to be dropping that video um, real soon. I'm, it's going to be a two part video. Actually, I, as I went through the day, I got into some things and, and just had to do some unconventional stuff so it, the video would have been super long so i'm gonna make it a two-part video but um greg that's that's kind of i mean i can't recommend them enough from the few i got from you i mean I've, i'm seeing tremendous things um in the bees and so it's pretty exciting beautiful i never saw the queen i was hoping to see her but i didn't spend a lot of time looking for her but she's obviously in there man because the bees are almost black and they're calm and they're exactly really what you told me they were going to be well, that's that's the cool thing is is to see what our queen line is doing not just in it's one thing for us to see what our queen line genetics do in ohio and maybe up in michigan uh, but when you see what they're doing in rhode island when you see what they're doing in alabama when you're seeing what they do in colorado and montana and all across the country and we're getting reports of them doing all of that same thing where they're brooding down in the winter time, they're kind of on their own, getting into that same size cluster. They can overwinter in a, in smaller numbers. They're more frugal with the resources, and they just wait for the cue from Mother Nature to say go. And then when they do, they just start ramping up. To me, that's a big deal. When you start to see and hear folks talk about the vibe of the frames, how the bees just kind of do, how they kind of move across the frame is different. They notice. These bees, they just, they're different. There's something chilled out about their vibe, the way they move across the frame. It's almost as though they are extremely intentional with their motions and their movements, kind of like the Tai Chi of bee lines, if, if you could ever have something like that. Of course, their, their color and things can, can vary sometimes. Even out of our, our, our uh, Caucasian line, we might have a straight red queen. Um, we might have some that are jet black. We might have some that have some tiger striped in it. You know, that can vary. Uh, but what they actually do in a colony, how they perform seems to be really uniform. And for me, that's exciting. And, and it's just another reminder um, that the bees are just doing um, what they should. And we're on the right track there. Bruce, what, what are we that's looking at the, here? This is that colony I was telling you about right here. Um, Look at that. See, just dark bees. Man, just incredible. Yep. They're dark. And that was, you see, I just taken the feeder off of here. And I'm going to tell you all, this was like, these bees were like in probably... Oh, three or four frames of, of three or four frames. Like what back last time I looked at them, wherever that was, you know, they were just in three or four frames. And now you can see literally it's side to side. This is the medium. There's a deep and a medium. And this joker was pretty much full of bees. Lots of brood, just real healthy looking, beautiful brood pattern. And you can see how, I don't know if you can tell up here on the feeder, how just, they just look almost black. They're so dark. Yeah. But uh, if you watch the video, you'll be able to see just how they were just, methodically i had i don't think i smoked them here they would have run down between the frames you can see i just pulled them out and you don't see any bees flying hardly at all in the air at all 
they just kind of were like, oh, well, hey, you know, and they just kept about going about their business. <laughs> so it was fun. I really enjoyed it. But I just thought that's I'd cool. share that with you real quick. Yeah, that's that's awesome. There's a lot of um, there's a couple of questions here that we're definitely going to get to. Richard Prager um, has one regarding uh, comb. I don't know if I can find it. Uh, I am not real good about scrolling back fast enough to find it. I noticed there was a little star feature where you can star it so you can find it. There it is right there. Uh, Richard Prager asked, Greg, how do you generate more drawn comb to cycle out um, older comb? W one of the things, uh, Richard, great question that we were passionate about was making bees. Um, honey is just is a byproduct of making bees, but one of our focuses is to grow colonies out. Yes, have production hives that we can gauge how prolific are they on honey, how prolific are they in making brood, um, but we make a lot of splits. So we don't really have comb that uh, really hangs around more than maybe three years max, maybe four at the very, very most. Any comb that lasts four years is really um, accidental where it ends up just staying in the yard, going back over winters, come back out of the spring. Uh, it wasn't drawn out enough to make a split, so it stayed in there. And that's the, really the only way that our comb gets dark enough. Um, a lot of our comb, when we make splits, we're actually adding fresh assembled frames with uh, Premier Foundation in our nukes because we want those nukes to have some fresh, clean, white comb for lots of different reasons. Not only is, I think, is it a, a health benefit for the hive to have fresh wax in it, but when you are making nukes, um, we are very, uh, to use the word, Bruce, intentional about the quality of our nukes. I want to be sure that I have the top-notch queen quality out of every single nuke. And uh, one of the tips and tricks of doing that is to make sure that you have fresh comb in the colony. Whenever folks are, are getting started or they, they need help or advice on how do they, where, how do I find a queen? That's a whole other separate conversation. Is Do you really need to find the queen or do you need to find evidence that the queen's been there? One of the ways that you can fast track that is by by adding fresh frames that the bees need to draw out in your boxes. A lot of times you will always find that queen on the freshest, whitest wax inside of a colony. And it's an easy way to get the gauge and see how many eggs, how fast, how well she's doing, how healthy the bees are, how fast they're actually drawing that comb and building up is a big deal too. So Richard, to answer your question, we are always cycling fresh comb in all the time, not only in our production yards or our production colonies, but also in the nukes, we make those splits. When we make a lot of these splits, we'll be pulling uh, sealed brood, so maybe even some um, open brood uh, and food sources. Those go into a split. I add some fresh frames in there and then let them build up. Drop the queen cell, let her uh, go on her mating flight, come back, start laying. And we're, we're on a 21 to 35 day queen cycle. So from the day that I drop that cell, the queen is very mature when she's in those boxes gives me enough time to go through and know that I'm not going to have any problems. Um, you know, for us, our, our, our name is on every single one of these nukes for all the nukes that we sell every single one of them. We are managing, we are touching as a family. It's a part of our farm legacy. You're, it's a part of nature's image farm, every single nuke. And um, so we want to make sure that those are high quality, beautiful nukes that are so good looking that we almost don't want to see them go. Um, so that's, so making sure we are cycling fresh comb in there is just a part of that. When we, when we were making these splits and making these nukes is in the spring of the year where it's, you can almost do no wrong up here and they are absolutely just drawing out gobs and gobs of wax. So we play to that even in our production, uh, colonies, making sure we've got fresh comb in there. So they will draw them out and, um, and kind of go to town. So to kind of recap tonight, if you are listening uh, to the Nature's Image Farm podcast, the Stream Team Beekeeping Chat live with us tonight, or you're checking out the replay tonight, we're talking about some of the pros and cons between packages versus nukes. Which is best? The answer is yes. They're both best, and we're trying to have an honest discussion of mm -hmm. the pros and the cons of both. But uh, I, I would challenge folks, if you if if you're getting advice from somebody and they say nukes are the only way to go and you're an idiot if you buy packages, I would thank them for their time and move on. And if you find someone who says packages are the only ways to go and nukes are junk, I would thank them for their time and I would move on. The fact of the matter is 
once you are aware of what at both actually do, um, the availability, the price points, the timing, when, when, when and what they do and why, there are great opportunities for both packages and nukes. Brian, you brought it up a little bit ago, and I, we didn't really um, uh, go into detail. But before we get into the last segment tonight, which is what's the difference between the overwintered nukes and the spring nukes, um, <laughs> you brought something up that's a big deal. And so I wanted to first uh, give you credit for bringing it up because it's an advanced idea. It's something that we're a big fan of here, too. I think you might have did you, you might have even got a video of me getting uh, uh, ate up by a bunch of bees, I think even doing it last year. Um, but I want to I want to put to rest the idea that folks shouldn't buy bees in the fact that uh, Bruce mentioned genetics do matter and why. So there's a genetic aspect to it, why it's important to buy those singles or those nukes so you can have the queen mother and also drones for your other bees to be getting mated by. That's a huge deal, and that's a big deal. But there's another way we hinted on a little while ago where some folks want to grow quicker than their bees are. Now, whether you think that's right or wrong, that's between you and your maker. But the fact of the matter is a lot of us are extremely, maybe overly ambitious, and that's what we do. There's huge opportunities in buying packages and splitting a package two, three, four, even 10 ways. And I know that sounds absolutely outlandish, but Brian, can you talk to us a little bit about your experience splitting a package? Mm -hmm. No, I, I had excellent luck doing it. Um, the, it was two years ago. I think I bought, was it, I, I don't know. I, I, I bought, you know, I, gosh, I forget how many packages, but then I had purchased a couple extra Queens and literally, you know, I, I set them up close to each other and just dumped a little here, dumped a little there and, and, you know, installed the Queens and, and it worked out really well. I mean, it's just, like I said earlier, it's a quick way that, you know, you purchase a package for, you know, gosh, I don't even know how much they are now. You know, let's just say 150 bucks and you buy a queen for 40 bucks, you're at $190 and you can have two colonies going, you know, and if you're getting them early enough, you know, at least in Ohio, you know, for nukes, like you said, you, you, you know, folks have to wait, gosh, what is it, late May, sometimes June, you know, you could have this package that you've split two ways. You can have a package that you even split three ways and watch it sting up your friend as he's doing it, you know, and, and it works out, you know. Um, I, I even in one of them, I thought it was not going to, to you know, I thought the queen, I thought I had messed up and the queen actually, I, I manually released her and she flew up in the air and <laughs> flew right down in the front, you know. Oh, that's great. I've had good luck doing it, but now, I mean, it just, it goes back a little bit. You know, I saw a comment in here saying, you know, it goes back to the beekeeper. It just goes back to the beekeeper and your comfort level. You know, would I tell somebody that is brand new and, you know, beginning beekeepers, I always tell them expect to have two colonies. Would I tell them to get a package and buy an extra queen and shake it? you know, and split that package and do that, I wouldn't, you know, just because right. they're not going to know if one is failing over the other or whatever. They're just looking and they're happy to see the bees and save the bees and, and everything. But yeah, it's, it's a, uh, once you learn it, uh, huh, I mean, the value in, in splitting packages is it's huge, huge. You know, it's a big deal. Gives you a lot of opportunities yeah. to oh, grow, yeah. to learn, um, to have fun, mm -hmm. and and you can certainly do that. One of the um, and I'm, there's 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 two sides of this, and so I'll be careful again. Um, but there is the there is the very cheap sales pitch that says, "Buy my B packages now," and then folks buy the B packages, and then uh, two months later you'll see the folks that are selling those packages and they'll say, requeen those junk queen genetics from your package with one of my locally adapted superior 
queens. And I just have to sit back and laugh and thinking that is so far off point that it, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's comical. Um, if the, if you didn't believe in enough of the bees that you were selling then the first off, why are you selling them to start with? And number two, are you that inex inexperienced with, with Queens and what they do to blame the performance on the queen on what state she was born in? There's a lot more to that conversation. The fact of the matter is, We've installed a package of bees and they see minus five in their first year in Ohio. They cruise right through and they could care less. And they did it in a five frame single. Mm -hmm. uh, case in point is Susie's top bar hive. You know, <laughs> check out, uh, go, to, go to Castle Hives. Uh, check out Susie's top bar hive videos where you see us dumping in a package with no care given really to yeah. anything. It was here's Susie's hive. We're sneaking these bees in there. And guess what's guess what colony is still thriving and surviving and just going like game busters right now? That's yeah. right. Those Georgia package bees. So don't sit there and tell me that somehow your locally adapted yep. bee is superior in every stretch, form, and fashion after you just sold somebody Georgia bees. That that's a that's a very poor business approach. Now we sell queens and we of course make those from our stock here locally. And do I think they're superior? In a lot of ways, they're more in tune with my goals for them. But the fact of the matter is, I am not telling folks, buy package bees to then say, you have to requeen these this summer or these bees are not going to make it through the winter. One of the biggest fallacies and flat out blatant lies is that Georgia bees won't make it through northern winters. That's a lie. That is not a fact. Um, and you can ask several beekeepers who have actually have experience with it, ask them what their experience is. And I, I'm here to say, you can 100% get a package that you bought in April. Not only can you get them through the winter, but you can get them through the winter after you've split them three times and pulled honey. Ask me how I know. We can go into great detail about that later. Now, if your goal in your bee yard is to, tooten, to, to tighten up and tune up your genetics, and you want to go from Italian and Carniolian uh, genetics from a package, and you want to steer that towards anything else in the world, then sure, requeen whenever you want later on in that year. Totally cool, and that is an upstanding practice, 100%. There, but we have to understand why it is that we're doing those things to make sure the, the when and the how are aligned. So there are huge opportunities on taking package of bees and splitting them three ways. We're getting two extra queens when you get your package and you're just dividing them out into three. You're putting those queens in there and those queens, if everything goes right and they are accepted and they build and you feed them, they will be large enough to make it through the winter. We've done that before. It's a great way to grow just the bees themselves while then adding whatever line you want to it. So it, it's, it's a cost effective way to grow your numbers and, and to grow a bee yard. So the, the it's the the argument is is actually I, I it's funny and not not laughing at you I'm laughing with you um, mm -hmm. it's just one of those things the issue that folks will say and it's that nukes are better than packages is because they're assuming that packages and nukes are available at the same time the fact of the matter is why in the world would you buy a package june 1st if you could buy a nuke june 1st well there may be some reasons maybe you did want to do a three-way split like that mm -hmm. maybe you wanted a learning opportunity maybe you just wanted to see what happened but if you were the best investment maybe bang for your buck if all things were equal and mm. those bees were available june 1st let's say and you had a choice let's just go right around the room brian if you had a choice to spend $200 on a nuke that was ready June 1st or spend $140 on a package on June 1st, which way would you go? If, if you knew the quality of the breeder and if you knew the quality of the bees. If, it, if I knew all of that and it was the same exact time of the year, I, without hesitation, I would most likely purchase a nuke. Yeah. Bruce? I would. I'd say. Yeah. 
th there are so a lot of times these arguments we're not even comparing apples and oranges we're comparing asparagus mm -hmm. with pears and it's like what are you talking about well so there are nuances and so i hope with tonight's conversation we've got just a little bit of time going through all these things um we're gonna we're gonna finish up here on overwintered versus spring to recap what we've talked about um earlier today um, nukes versus packages typically packages are available way earlier in the year they give folks the opportunity to get some equipment and some or get bees on dead out equipment it uh, gives the beginning beekeeper an opportunity to get started early in the year before nukes are ready uh, price points nukes are typically going to be right around 200 bucks packages are 140 so there is a slight price difference but all things being equal you're getting more bang for your buck in a nuke when you actually look to see what's inside a nuke. Will year one package produce honey? Will year one nuke produce honey? They sure will. And sometimes either may need split. So there can be significant abundance in both depending on your management and also the weather, how the flow uh, kind of comes in. So that does matter. Do genetics matter? Well, they do to a certain extent. When that matters to you dictates, I think, when you make a move one way or the other to go towards nukes that have drones from the same genetic line that you want to see to start getting established in your yard versus packages are kind of just used as bulk bees to get things started, get those extra numbers, and to give you those opportunities earlier on in the year. Will both make it through the winter? Yes, if you keep them healthy. But here's something I want to bring up. You can take, you guys, in your mind, this is, there's a, this is a, um, a hypothetical question. And a, what, what's, what, what's the type of question where you, there is no response needed? That's the kind of question that this is. In, in everybody's mind right now, I want you to picture the perfect bee, the perfect colony, and the perfect opportunity where you would be buying these bees, Okay. So think about that. In your mind, we're going and da, 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 da. Okay, cool. Here it is. So here is the most beautiful, picturesque colony. Let's call it a nuke. Let's call it a package. Well, the fact of the matter is you can take the absolute best quality of bees and a nuke and put that into the hands of someone inexperienced, and it's still going to crash. Okay. On the flip side, you could take the lowest quality nuke, all the things that we talked about earlier today, the lowest quality nuke or package in the hands of an experienced beekeeper, and they could, do fun they could be phenomenal. Produce honey, get through the winter, and need split. So the responsibility, yes, I feel folks should take more responsibility for the quality of bees that they're selling, but on the flip side... As a beginning beekeeper or somebody who doesn't quite have their beekeeping dialed in, you can't blame the bees if the bees die every single time. Are there circumstances where there could be health issues and they were on a downward spiral to start? Yes, but that's too easy. That, that's, that's too easy of an out too many of the times. A lot of the things that are causing bees to die with one to three year beekeepers, a lot of the times isn't the bees, it's the beekeeper. And I know that's harsh. I know folks don't want to accept that. But as soon as you accept responsibility for those lives that you are stewarding, mm -hmm. the faster you will get them in a positive situation and you will grow along with those bees. Last thing I want to talk about tonight, fellas, overwintered nuke versus a spring nuke. What in the world are they? Which one's better? Bruce, what are your thoughts on overwintered nukes versus a spring nuke? Well, I was thinking about that earlier, and I've never put a lot of thought into it. However, after I've heard Bob speak, and we've talked here a little bit, and, and uh, just hearing some different things, there is, is a real advantage, I believe, to having a late summer queen in a colony that's been established, maybe come out of winter. They're going to be able, I think, to hit the ground running and maybe produce in the upcoming year. I, I don't really know that I have a huge opinion on that because, um, <laughs> because yeah, uh, I, I just, I've, I've had good experience with both. And most of the nukes, honestly, that I've, I've had in the past have been created in the spring. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, you get a good, healthy, brand new queen in there. She's going to be motivated. She's going to do well. And so I don't have a strong opinion on that. But just thinking about looking down the road, um, you know, from what I've heard in recent times, maybe that overwintered nuke. But I don't know if there's a huge, huge advantage either way, in my opinion. I just I don't can, have a huge opinion on that. Ryan, you're the up. budding master beekeeper. What's the difference between an overwintered nuke? And a spring new. I'm gonna have I'm gonna have Bruce is gonna sit back and he's gonna I know he'll be thinking about this. And I read this the other day, and um I, I don't know who wrote it, but it was on on the face thing, you know, that that chat thing, and it was another beekeeper, and you know, it's just everybody right now is talking about packages and then nukes and they're like oh you need to get an overwintered nuke and you know a nuke that's made in the spring isn't going to be as good and this and that and this person said i've been doing it for years when you buy an overwintered nuke now granted what you had mentioned bruce that applies you know you might have you know that couple month old queen and they're going to perform a hair better possibly but what you're paying for and what this guy said, it made perfect sense to me was you are paying for that beekeeper's experience and that beekeeper's management of those colonies. Is that nuke going to perform just as good as what it did in that person's yard? Are your management skills the same as his or hers? So you have to consider that you're paying for that person's ability to manage that colony. And I sat back about that. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. I sat back and I was looking at it and then I was reading a lot of the comments and he got some hatred, but it made perfect sense. And, but people don't want to hear that, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and it does make perfect sense though. I mean, now granted, if you're, you know, Bruce, for you, you're, you know, you tend to want to manage your colonies, so for someone like you, yeah, I would say, hey, it, it would probably excel. You know, you might see them brood up faster. I, I, I don't know, you know, know um, but that's just food for thought there, you know. Yeah, I want to I want to hear Greg's Greg's opinion, because I think he obviously has one here. So oh, Greg, yeah. Greg, Greg, let's hear what you got to say. You can tell looking at him. <laughs> I love you guys. Hey, I love Brian, everyone listening Brian, make, tonight. Make him big. Make him big on the screen. I got it. big on the screen. I'm going to insert Greg's Greg's phrase. You know, I, I know I got to say <laughs> something here, and I know I, I, just, I don't want to upset anybody. I don't want to preach. You no, know, but you know we've got B. What was that B? Uh, B. B. Van. Uh, Greg. B. The, the B. Evangelism. The, yeah, the, the, the B. You know, yeah. I've evangelism. got to have a moment of evangelism right now and you know everybody don't take this the wrong way but i just i need to say this it's on my heart greg you go ahead take it away greg what is an overwintered nuke i want you to think about that i want you to think about what people think an overwintered nuke is and where or where there's not value to that now most folks who are interested in buying an overwintered nuke are a beginning beekeeper and they feel as though that the bees in this box, they have made it through the winter. Therefore they are hardy, they're superior and they are high quality. The fact of the matter is most overwintered nukes aren't even sold until springtime. Now, Brian, you're working on your master beekeeper. For all those folks who are raising bees, by now, we should have enough of a basic knowledge to understand that bees have a lifespan. Mm -hmm. Those bees that were born and emerged and went into Ohio's winter came into existence sometime around October, maybe November, throughout the winter time, there may have been a couple bees a day at most, maybe emerging. So there mm-hmm. was some fresh bees emerging throughout the winter. And from equinox forward, we're getting more daylight every single day. 
the queen is getting triggered to lay more eggs. While mm -hmm. it might be slight, as we get into this time of season, especially here in Ohio, where our maples are blooming and the bees are bringing back pollen, and they're starting to find some nectar, and we're getting more daylight, queen's laying more eggs. So right now in February, the queens are starting to brood up. And by the time we get into March, it's nearly full on. So when folks are buying bees in May and they think they're buying an overwintered nuke, every bee in that box was actually laid and emerged in the spring of this year. Mm -hmm. Every single bee, except for who? The queen. The queen. That one bee. So in an overwintered nuke, now there, there can always be a handful of straggler drones that have somehow, maybe they were around in December. And there's, there, they, you know, not every drone gets kicked out of the colony. Contrary to popular belief, you can crack, and we have cracked open colonies in December and January and found drones even in Ohio. So that being said, maybe you have a rogue drone, but even that lifespan doesn't pan out. So in an overwintered nuke, Folks believe they're getting bees that made it through the entire winnie are hardy, are, are somehow have adapted to the local weather and therefore should do better for them because they've already seen a winter. Mm -hmm. That's a flat out lie. If you are buying an overwintered nuke in May, the only thing that overwintered is the queen. Mm -hmm. That's a conversation for a different day. But do you really want a two year old queen? We're going to briefly touch on it here in a moment. Now, Here's the caveat. If you are buying an overwintered nuke in February, hey, you have some bees that just went through the winter time. Might have only been December 30th, so we could call it last year's bee. Um, are we technically still in winter? Yes. So technically you could say these bees were born in the winter, but that's this of this current year. So I want folks to consider that. Why in the world... Do you think that's what you're getting? Well, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of transparency when it comes to selling nukes. And so if folks find more value in an overwintered nuke, then the prices are automatically higher for an overwintered nuke. And in fact, you're buying last year's queen with this year's bees. Now, where is that a value? It is a value. Um, we have some folks that we're working with this year. They want our genetics. They want to start making queens and making splits. And if anyone has tried to force a one-year queen to choke her down in one box or two and not give her any room to lay to try to get her to put on queen cells, sometimes they won't do it, not in the first year. But that queen coming out into her, going through her first winter, coming out of the spring, going into her 18-month, into her two-year cycle, those queens, however are way more swarmy, and they can certainly put on queen cells. So what I pose is that if folks are interested in a two-year queen, it's definitely not for prolificness. It's definitely not for her laying up a storm and doing better than a one-year queen because that's just not the, that's not the facts. However, if you want to take a queen from a known genetic line and you want to make splits and you want that colony to, to do all the work and you want to force them down, have them put on queen cells, cut those queen cells out or move those frames and make splits. Then that's where that second year queen in a overwintered colony makes a lot of sense. But it has more to do with you moving your yard in a certain direction genetically. It is not and it should not be because you think all those bees somehow bypassed the life cycle and biology of the honeybee. And they were all somehow made it through the winter time. There's a lot of misconception oh. around that, a lot of fallacy around that. <clears throat> and um, so it's there's we are we have sold uh, breeder queens this year. We've got breeder queens that folks are interested in in breeder nukes that have last year's queen in it for very good reason. That's a different approach. That is not I am not selling an overwintered nuke with last year's worker bees in it. You can't do it. Yeah. So a little bit of knowledge goes a long way. I think the key on all that is the queen, like you say. And, and 
you know, when I think over winter nuke, I think I was thinking more, you know, I mentioned earlier the queen, if it was a late season queen, like a late summer, post summer solstice queen, you know, or a fall queen that you put in there, you know, you said over, let's say over winter queen instead of over winter nuke, obviously those bees are new, but then that queen is going to be really ready to hit the ground running. I think that's an advantage, but if you're making it to May and you've got a, you know, you've got a bee still in a nuke, how strong are those bees anyway? Because they should be to me, you should have split them at least once or twice by then or put them in a bigger box by May or June. At least, I mean, I think it's that way up there too. I know you guys have some stuff going to start kicking in pretty soon up there. So, you know, a new, a five frame box is not very big, you know, for a, you know, you, to me, an overwintered nuke is one you're going to get early in the year. You know, if right. it's a healthy colony, like in, you know, it was, I'm talking about not an old, really old queen, just maybe a queen from, this late summer if it's from the previous spring like you say that queen's starting to get old and she may make it through one more solid year and then she's going to be trying to hit the trees the next year or whatever but you know i, I think you're going to have a hard time holding them down a good strong queen once they hit that flow even your queens greg that brew way back once that flow hits man you better be getting ready i mean if, you, if you're going to sell an overwintered nuke and, and you're gonna wait till may then they may not be that strong of bees in my opinion because they're going to be busting out of the box way before then so that's a thought too um, there is a There's question a that has been, here. yeah, uh, Greg must not sell overwintered nukes from, from dry cut honey. You're right. Why in the world yeah. would I step over a dollar to pick up a quarter D from, from a business aspect? Why would I sell a colony in February or March that when that split. colony can make three splits? If I let them brood up and do their thing, is there a market for overwintered? Yes. But if you are not selling those bees in the actual winter of the year, you're selling somebody a two-year-old queen, which from a business aspect, what better way to get rid of your old queens than to get rid of them and overwintered nukes? I mean, so that that's, yeah, that's the challenge absolutely. of it, you know, just as when folks are – so I'm not – if hey. you believe in overwintered nukes and you believe in overwintered queens, I am not here to step on your toes. I'm just telling you. Uh, if if you are selling nukes and it's a business, you're you're stepping over a dollar to pick up a quarter just to sell a product to somebody that they really don't understand what it is. And whether you're not you do that, I'm not here to say it's good or bad. I'm just saying um, customer education is one of the, the the trickiest things, unfortunately. And that's how a lot of these things get into the marketplace at all. And I would say, too, if you buy a nuke like from you, Greg, or anybody that is a freshly mated queen and she is taken off and doing well, you know, that, that hive, that colony is probably going to just kick it all the way through the year, you know, and then next year you can worry about hopefully requeening or whatever that hive, but you get a brand new queen in there that's motivated. That's just freshly mated and she's starting to lay. Like you said, she's going to maybe fill that box up and not want to swarm. And it's just going to be so many good things to having that young queen in there. So there are a lot of advantages to having a, a nice new, fresh young queen in there in the springtime. Mm -hmm. It, it just works. It's, it's a really, I think, an advantage in a lot of ways. And so, so many different things to look at here. So many There's different so many to look things at to look at. And I think the, the biggest opportunity um, with an overwintered nuke is if you are buying um, that nuke that has that, that solstice queen in it. When you're buying yeah, a queen that about, was yeah. made late in the year, I think there's beautiful opportunities for that because she is just coming into her essence into the spring. Um, that's a big deal. But that's not how overwintered nukes are typically sold. They're typically that's sold right. as these are hardy, adaptive bees that have gone through the winter. They're strong enough to make it. You'll Survivor do great bees. with them as their first year. No one has yeah. no, Solstice Queens is right. not on a beginning beekeeper's radar. That is right. Great should right. be. I would, I would have to ask them. So if I were to purchase this overwintered nuke, would those bees then in that colony be resistant to varroa mites oh my god well they would be resistant to a varroa mike that's it i've got i've got about i've got about 30 different proposed names for this thing so i have no idea what we're gonna do all right bruce what is it what are we going for here i don't i don't have a name here it is i gotta <laughs> I have, pick, I have to pick from 30 names. I don't know. I don't know. And the winner is the 2023 <laughs> overwintered might name on Bruce's Bees YouTube channel is Bruce. Uh, I don't know. 
How about Bruce? I don't know. I've got, I've got the name. Well, I've got thirty. I've got a pick. I got. I'll, I'll announce it next time. How's that sound? We may take a vote. Oh man, time. I don't know. I got a pick. There's so many good ones. Mikey the mate. I've got a bunch, man. I know it's horrible. Vlad. We got Vlad, Vladimir Mites. We've got Velma, yeah. uh, Varroa Mike, which is that's one you're already using. I like that, uh, Greg. Bruce, that's Bruce, getting into some weird this, territory there Bruce, on names Bruce, and yeah. listen to this, Bruce Almighty. Did you get that? All Bruce, Bruce Almighty. 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 <laughs> mm-hmm. We've got uh, man, so many cleaners. You know, it could be on, a, how dare it assume that it's a female might. It could be a boy might. It could be a daddy it might. Could be. It could be it could Mini, Mike, Almighty. Mini Mike, Dracula, yeah. mm-hmm. Mighty Marge. I like it. Uh, I don't know. There's so many. Mini Might. I, I got to. Yeah. I don't know. What do you guys yeah, Bruce, think? Bruce. What's your I favorite think, name? I think you have to pick. I wonder. Let's see. Uh, is, uh, I tell you what, Bruce or Brian is the whiz here. Brian, do you know how to do the uh, the wheel of or the. Uh, oh, we could uh, do that. Hashtag. Uh... <laughs> so I just I just thought of something that. Uh, I wonder if somewhere, and and who knows where it's at right now. You know, I I saw in here about asking about Yappy's mug. But I wonder if you weren't to locate Yappy's mug. And it's almost like, what's that little magic, that little magic ball where you would shake it and it gives you like an answer? magic eight. I wonder if you would shake Yappy's mug. And if a piece of paper fell out of it, if it would have the name of a Varroa. I've got to you know? have the mug. I've got to have them. I've got to have the mug first. Can you find it somewhere? I mean, where is it? There it is. What? <gasps> Just How? <laughs> look at that. What? There it is. It just Look at the names wow. on Yappy's mug. It'll never drink again. So there's the Yappy, same. yes, and Greg on there. There's <laughs> my name. So I'm going to do name? this. Yeah, I put it on here. I had, oh, I'm not wow. into that kind of stuff. So this on there said angle. I hope it's I'm just being different there. But I'm going to take I'm these names here. Name we're top of mine. That's cool. I've got these names written down. So before, next time we'll do this. Next time, a week from now, it'll be on Brian's channel, right? And I will put these up. Frank. Frank, <laughs> that's a pretty good name. I'm gonna write that down on my Varroa Mite list. That is a good name, Frank. Yeah. Since we're since we're talking about Yappy's mug tonight, that'll be perfect. Guys, but we are in. I'm gonna absolute I'm gonna shake them up tonight. I'm gonna shake, shake them up. up next time, and we will next time. I don't have yeah. time to write them all down, and I'll put them in. All here, right, I and like we'll it. Dump them out next week, and Do then it. we'll just we'll go from there. <laughs> so might well, be the yeah. best episode. I better yet. I better hide this thing because yeah, he could actually drive down here and steal this thing back from me. So I better better hide it. I better find a. I better Yappy find my has penis. an attack bird, a predatory attack Ooh. bird that he does take oh, out, God. and it, it does things. It can go fetch. I shouldn't things. have. I should have waited till I sent it to the next person before I said that I even had it. That is I true because he could come down here and he could he could send old the old type bird to come and take my head off if i'm not you're gonna walk out in the morning and get you know you're gonna have a red tail tack bird you know come out of nowhere yeah uh well Well, now we know where the bug is i've enjoyed uh tonight's um conversation of uh nukes versus packages and uh i i want to encourage folks to um don't just take our word for it just because we are passionate and on fire and we're speaking from our experience doesn't mean that you shouldn't uh, do what you think is best for you. That's what this is about, is you having that relationship with your bees. Um, like I say in our talks that we give to clubs um, and at conferences, um, there's no right way or wrong way. There's just the way that works for you and your bees. And so I want to encourage folks to keep an open mind, um, even though at some points you might be just dead set on a certain uh, method, modality, or belief system when it comes to your bees. Be open because you just don't know when you can literally have that paradigm shift. And that's that's a big deal. So I want to thank everyone listening tonight. The Nature's Image Farm podcast, the stream team, beekeeping chat live. And then also, if you're checking out the replay, we want to thank you guys as we close it out tonight. Uh, any final thoughts, Bruce? Just real quickly, I thought about this uh, several times and you hit on it briefly, Greg. Uh, when we're talking about beekeeping in general, whether it be packages, nukes, or catching swarms or anything, 
remember that the management is key. Uh, you mentioned context is key. What are your goals? What are you trying to do? Mm-hmm. You know, we talked about the responsibility of the beekeeper. Of mm-hmm. course, there are genetics that do different things. And sometimes we do have a hive that is just a dud. Um, sometimes we have that hive that just never really gets on, on its feet, never gets going. And so sometimes we're going to lose one here or there. But, <clears throat> but instead of playing a blame game, we should look into ourselves and say, what can I do better? If I lose a colony, I want to know what I did wrong. And so then I can fix it next time and try to get better. So many times the, the big, I mean, the bee producers will say it was the, the beekeeper's fault. The new beekeeper or the, the customer will say it was the bad bees. Let's just stop with the name game. Let's just stop with blaming yeah. everybody else. Right. Yeah. If, if we, even if we, as a, as a consumer, if I go and buy a nuke from someone or even a package and it's not what it needs to be, and I didn't know any better. Well, that's a lesson learned. Next time I'll try and do better. You know, I'll, I'll figure out what was wrong. And there's something to be learned from that. So instead of just blaming other people for everything, uh, learn the skill and do your best to, to be successful, whether you're selling or purchasing the bees, and then just try to get better every day. And, and if you'll do that, it can create a lot of much better relationships with people and you will become a much better beekeeper for doing it and be able to be successful. So just take that responsibility and just move forward to learn. I think that's important to, to just remember that. Awesome. Brian? Good stuff. Oh, I don't know what to add. This has been a... Final thoughts on this whole uh, package nuke yeah. conundrum that so many folks find themselves caught up in. Yeah, I know. It's been, it's been a great chat. Um, you know, I think it just boils down. I mean, just to go off a... Of, I'll just piggyback and continue saying, you know, context is key, you know, management, you know, one's ability to manage the colonies, that's key. You know, just there's just so many factors there, you know, just to point a finger and say, well, you know, this nuke was junk and this and that, whatever. And that's like I said about my situation with the nuke, you know, I just, I didn't know, you know, so I can't point fingers and blame that much on who sold it to me, but, you know, you have to own things and know how to manage. And yeah, I mean, the situation's going to turn out, you know, in the positive. Um, But, you know, uh, I still, you know, for me, if it was, you know, buying a package over a nuke, I'll, I'll just say, you know, I would probably do a package. If it was June 1st at the same time, yeah, I'd, take a visit down to nature's image farm and buy one of those awesome nukes that, you know, this, their fellow Greg that we know puts together. So, but yeah, you know, context is key, everybody. And just, you know, learn to manage them. And, you know, I mean, we've seen, I think a lot of people, like I saw comments earlier, people saying, Oh, well, Brian went full circle and all this and that. And that's just because I learned how to manage things a little bit better. So, you know, one's ability to manage colonies and things like that. I mean, that just plays huge. So, yeah. Well, that's, you just touched on, on, on a, on a, Bruce, what's going on here? Holy. It is getting out of control. Wow. Look at that. Bruce has a mite stuck on top of its head. The thing is just his mind of its own. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know, I would not recommend using it as a belt buckle. Right. Don't ask me how I know. You don't want to do that. Don't. I kind of like my kind of like my pet mite. It's not on my bees, so I'm okay with it. Yeah. Yeah. I, like I, it. I do want to add one thing though, and this is kind of like a little a little teaser. And Greg knows, you know, I, I was recently down at, at Greg's place, and uh, there was some advanced work going on there. You see what I'm not letting any cats out of the bag. Mm-hmm. Advanced mm-hmm. work, but you know, I did leave. Uh, you know, Greg's place with some equipment. So mm-hmm. there will be, I think in the next, I don't know, everybody will know the direction that I'm going probably in the next two or three weeks. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I have some wood to make a stand or, you know, maybe two stands. I don't know. And then I have some other new equipment. So, you know, that'll be coming up soon people. So the hashtags, whatever, It'll it'll all come out and be public. Hashtag Brian seventy five. 
Uh, Ryan, it was great having you down um, at the farm, hanging out. It's always good. Uh, I was uh, I was hanging some um, insulated foam boards uh, in the in the new warehouse, and I I stepped back and I looked and I thought, man, I'm a knucklehead. My, how come? How come my screws don't look as good as Brian's? Brian's are all like even and nice, and and mine are just like doop 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 doop. doop. And I'm thinking, man, that's that's what I get. Should have had should have had more work for Brian to do while he was here and make it all look good. But uh, it was it was it's always fun having you down, Brian. Oh, it's a good time. And, um, I'm looking forward to uh, 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 watching you let the cat out of the bag on what you're up to. Hashtag Brian seventy five. Uh, and um, just kind of following along. I'm looking forward to seeing, uh, checking out Bruce, some of uh, Bruce's new videos too, and uh, okay. kind of following along on his spring explosion. And uh, it always gets us excited to see the weather moving from uh, down there all the way back up. And it's it's already here um, in in a big way. It's the the, the maples yeah. are, are are blooming. They're on fire with with with, with pollen, and the bees are going absolutely nuts. Um, and so, Brian, you mentioned something there um, about kind of going full circle. And I think there's so much uh, wisdom to that when we spend time learning and having an experience with anything in life, but beekeeping, especially, it's easy to get complacent. It's easy to just fall back on what you think, you know, and what you're comfortable with. A lot of times that doesn't leave us a lot of room to change or to do something different because some would argue that it goes against everything you were or you stood for. And unfortunately, like anything else, some folks identify with a certain way of beekeeping, whether I'm an only an eight frame or I'm only a medium or I'm only a treatment free or I'm only this. And that's totally cool, whatever you want to do. But the fact of the matter is, is if you get too stuck and steadfast on doing something a certain way because you identify with it um, or you are too stubborn or you're afraid to change, there could be some great opportunities for you and your beekeeping experience and journey. So Brian, I like what you said there about you've, you've gone around and around, you've tried different things. Um, and that's learning. That is, that is con what works right now might not work next year. You know, and Brian, as you are stepping out of the, the, the closet sideliner and you, you, you get into this realm, we joke, but that's, that's a lot of times as you grow and you have enough colonies, you get enough experience. You get enough cycles on that unit to say, hey, man, maybe I didn't know what I was talking about, even though I said it and even though that I did it and although that I practiced it and even though I might have preached it. There's always room for change and there's always room to do things different and to learn and to keep doing better. And that's an important thing, I think, with beekeeping is to try to be as open minded as possible. Don't get too comfortable with what you think, you know, because things change. And uh, I think that's one of the fun things about beekeeping is always trying to figure it out. And um, that's so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing both of what you guys do coming up here in the spring on your YouTube channels. And um, here at the farm, we've got a lot of exciting things uh, to kind of uh, to go on. We're going to talk more about that on the Sunday night uh, farm chats. Uh, Susie and I both are enjoying those podcasts that we're doing live every Sunday night on the Nature's Image Farm YouTube channel. Some weeks we might be talking about starting seeds. Sometimes we might be talking about apiary planting, making splits, um, raising pigs. You just never know what you're going to find, but it's going to be authentic. We're going to be having a good time doing it. And it's all based on what we do as a family here on the farm. If you're in the Ohio area um, or surrounding states and you're still looking for packages um, or nukes, uh, we still have availability. You can go to naturesimagefarm.com. We have package bees that are available for eight and then also the end of April. So April 8th, we have some packages available the end of April and we have nukes available late May, early June. The nukes are made from our bees. Uh, so those are going to be Caucasian, Carney, uh, Italian lines of bees here. Our queens, of course, are made from our breeders um, that we just have bred year after year even crossed with with some new genetics. And uh, those are also going to be available uh, starting in about right now. Our first availability, we're sold out of May and the first part of June. Just the very end of June right now is our queen availability. And we hope that changes as we grow um, that, that part of our business. There's a lot of fun things on our website too. Uh, this is the time of year where uh, starting tomorrow, we are putting 
our Hive Alive pollen patties on all of our colonies. We're not giving the full one pounders, but we're going to split that out into about thirds and give each colony about a third of a pound to see what they do with it. They are absolutely gobbling down and destroying the dry pollen sub. So for me, that's a cue to go ahead and step it to the next level. And we're going to give them smaller amounts of the Hive Alive uh, pollen patty. And why I think that is something folks uh, should consider, uh, the Hive Alive pollen patty is made with 100% USA pollen. That's right. It has real pollen in it. Hive Alive is partnered with Global Patties, which is one of the most phenomenal patties on the market. Uh, but where I think this one shines above all of the others is that it has the Hive Alive liquid in it, which is going to have thymol. It's going to have uh, also am amino acids and other nutrients, which is a big deal, including seaweed, things that are going to help with not only bee gut and digestion, but also help with their health, getting them built up and ready for the springtime. If you're interested in learning more about that or you want to order some and have it shipped or pick up here at the farm, you can go check us out at naturesimagefarm.com. Susie's busy every day um, shipping out all those kind of things, including uh, bucket feeders and the, and the plugs, the bucket plugs for the one-gallon feeders. We're going to learn more about that. If you want to learn more about joining us at the Learning Yard at Nature's Image Farm, you can go to our website, naturesimagefarm.com. I hope tonight's conversation um, kind of shed some light into um, packages and nukes. If I stepped on any toes, if I've hurt anyone's feelings, I, I want to say that I'm sorry. Um, but what I mean by that is um, sometimes we're just like that kid sitting in that wood pew and we think the preacher's harping on us. It's usually for a good reason. So I'd ask that you just consider the things that we uh, talked about tonight. And uh, hopefully that helps you in your beekeeping journey. And maybe it helps you to choose is a package or a nuke right for you. And uh, I want to thank again, everyone for joining us on the nature's image farm podcast, the stream team live chat, and also the replay Bruce, Brian, as always, it's a pleasure having you guys on sharing your thoughts, uh, sharing your experience. Uh, you guys are awesome next week. Whose channel is it on fellas? I think it's Brian's. No. Okay. Yeah. Next, I think next Wednesday, 8 PM on the castle hives. YouTube channel would be the beekeeping stream team chat, mm -hmm. the stream team beekeeping chat. Looking forward to that. And Bruce is going to have a big one too in a week after that. So a lot of great mm -hmm. information. Uh, this is the time of year where it is just fast and furious. So I wish everyone um, all the best this coming spring. As always, I want to remind you to be the lighthouse and be the change you want to see in this world. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.